Rumpole and the Eternal Triangle by John Mortimer, adapted by Richard Stoneman. With me, Timothy West, as the elder Horace Rumpole, and Benedict Cumberbatch as the younger Horace Rumpole. I seem to remember that it was late June 1956, a hot night, and we'd been taken by Claude Erskine Brown to listen to the Castorini Trio. I realised the female violinist was very good-looking, hair of a reddish gold, and her face was heart-shaped. She seemed to be smiling at me. Excuse me, uh, <clears throat> what can I get you, Erskine Brown? Um, I think, um... Tomato juice. What I wanted was a large glass of Chateau Thames Embankment. Not much chance of that in a small pub tucked away in a mews off Wigmore Street, Excuse packed me. with fans of chamber music and, as it turned out, some musicians. I was sure it was you. I'm sorry? Elizabeth Castorini, the fiddle player. Surely you remember. We met some time ago. Did we? I can't believe you've forgotten me. And you would be quite wrong to believe that, because, of course, I haven't forgotten you. Uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd love to meet up again. Perhaps somewhere quieter than this. Would that be possible? Well, let me think. I was faced with the very earliest stages of a dilemma. Did I really want to be blown off course by this siren voice? Yes, sir. What can I get you? The barman gave me his attention at a most inconvenient moment. At the same time, the pianist from the trio came over and put his arm around the beautiful violin player, who happened to be his wife. Come on, Elizabeth, we've got to go. You'll ring me, Mr. Rumpo. Wimbledon, double five, six, four. And then she was gone. I pulled out a pencil and made a note on my programme. What are you writing there, Rumpo? Oh, I um, <clears throat> just wanted to remember the name of that tune they were playing. What was it again? Schubert's Piano Trio, number one in B-flat major. But it's printed all over the programme. Ah. Maybe it was. But what I'd written down was Wimbledon double five six four. It was a week later... A long, dull week doing a post office fraud in Acton, when I felt driven, for the sake of adding a little colour to my life, to dial that number on my programme. Elizabeth Castorini answered at once, in the soft, out of breath voice I kept hearing in my head. I was going to ring you if you hadn't rung me. Jolly good. Well, what about a spot of lunch then? Of course. I'd love to. Oh, good. We fixed on lunch at Rules for the next Thursday. On the morning of the assignation, I called in at Alfredo's barber shop in Fetter Lane for a shave and a trim. Ah, there we are, Mr. Rampole. All done, sir. Ah, very neat and tidy, thank you. And will you try a little fragrancy? Hmm? Well, what exactly... Are you suggesting, Alfred? An American rather manly perfume, Old Spice. A very you, if I may say so, sir. Our younger customers insist it does wonders for your quality of life. May I splash a little? Oh. Splash away, then. <laughs> it was a day when caution was to be thrown to the wind. Oh! Oh! Ah! Ah! Hmm. Ah. Oh, yes. Rules in Maiden Lane was one of the few places in London where you could still find a decent steak and kidney pudding in 1956. Your usual table, Mr. Rumpole? Yes, I'm meeting some... Ah, there she is. When I turned up at three minutes past one, Elizabeth was already waiting. Sorry I'm late. Don't be silly. Smelling of fresh fields, while I had the uneasy feeling that I was giving off the odour of a cut-priced dance hall in Brooklyn. Well, now... I don't know what you'd like, steak and kidney or rare beef or, or Irish stew. You don't eat meat, do you? Um, has been known. Mr. Rumpole! Horace, please. Horace? Really? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, ready to order, sir, uh, madame? Oh, uh, I think so, yes. What about a selection of fresh vegetables? Uh, well, if you really think... I had, after all, come to see her and not the roast pheasant. Just vegetables for you, sir? Of course. The waiter took our meat-free order and disappeared to the kitchen. 
Elizabeth leant towards me. You look very nice. So... so do you. You strike me as being someone full of love. Love? Well... Uh, yes, I, I suppose I... suppose I can love people. With a few exceptions. Mr. Justice Oliphant, for instance, and Sam Ballard. He's the head of our chambers. What's the matter with Sam? Isn't he lovable? I wouldn't say that being lovable was one of Soapy Sam's most obvious qualities. Then love him. That's what he probably needs most in his life. Have you chosen the wine, sir? Oh, uh, just about to do so. Really? Meeting you is quite enough stimulation for me. Stimulation? Don't you feel the same way? Uh, yes. I, I suppose I do. Then I'm sure we don't need wine. What's their water like? <laughs> I'd never tasted the water in rules. A, a jug of water, please. Nor anywhere else come to that. Excellent choice, sir. After the waiter had been dispatched to fetch a jug full of this unusual tipple, I asked Elizabeth why she wanted to lunch with me. Does there have to be a reason? Well, there usually is. <laughs> you say that because you're a lawyer. I admired you so much when you were doing Billy's case. I thought then, and I still think now, that I'd like to get to know you just a little bit better. Um, Billy's case? Billy Palmer, from my college. I used to come to court every day to watch you defend him. You must remember. What could I say? That Billy Palmer rang no bell with me whatsoever? I took the line of maximum politeness. Of course I remember. Elizabeth pushed back her hair, looked down at the tablecloth, and confessed. I've been so lonely. But you're part of a trio. We play music together. We play pretty well. But Tom can't seem to accept that I'm married to Desmond. She began to tell me all about her life with the musicians. Desmond Castorini, the pianist, was her husband. Tom Randall was the hefty athlete astride his cello. Tom, it seemed, was terribly jealous of Desmond. And Desmond was inexcusably suspicious of Tom. In this welter of masculine emotion, Elizabeth felt left out, unconsidered, no more than an object that they were both fighting over. And Desmond made her nervous. Desmond has this wild blood inside him. What on earth do you mean? He's Irish. His father got involved with the Republicans, shot a man in Dublin. Desmond still got the pistol. What pistol? The one his father used to shoot the man in Dublin. Oh. He gave the gun to Desmond before he went on the run. And Desmond keeps it in our attic in case his father ever needs it again. You must get rid of it, Elizabeth. Take the pistol to the police. It's... Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Desmond would never forgive me, and if he got cross, Tom would notice, and then... Oh. You see, we're together all the time, the three of us. Mm. Sometimes I feel I want to get miles away from both of them. It would help so much if you and I could meet, just occasionally, so I could have someone to talk to. I don't see why that couldn't be arranged. I get the feeling that something awful's going to happen. Don't ask me what, exactly. I looked down and saw a strange sight. Her hand was on mine. It felt cool and comforting, as if there was no weight to it at all. She kept it there for a little while, and I have to confess I felt... something... Back in chambers, in the clerk's room, it seemed that other people were also feeling something. And when I stare into your eyes, those deep pools of lustful promise, and glimpse the soft breasts that lurk beneath your silk blouse, hear the whisper of your stockings when you cross your legs... You mustn't say those things. You know you mustn't. What the hell is going on in here? Henry! Get off the floor, man. Oh. The first I heard of this peculiar scene was when I was walking back from the Old Bailey with Soapy Sam Ballard, QC, 
the alleged head of our chambers. Ah, Ballard, just the man I need. You seem flushed, Claude. How can I help? Oh, we're in deep, deep trouble. Good heavens. Someone has been trying to force their amorous advances on a defenseless and innocent young woman. A sexual proposition in chambers. When will you ever learn, Claude? Not me. Oh. Who then? I'll report further when I've got a full statement from the complainant. The who? The girl in question. Oh, I see. In my view, we must get her cooperation before we move an inch further. The reputation of three equity court hangs in the balance. <laughs> I couldn't forget my lunch with Elizabeth Castorini. At odd and inappropriate moments during the day, I'd remember the look in her eyes, her faint, apologetic smile, as she laid her hand on mine. I felt there was something a little gross about my existence compared to the purity of hers. No chops for me, thank you. What did you say? I said no chops for me, thank you. As a matter of fact... I'm giving up meat. Oh, Paul. Are you feeling quite yourself? I feel wonderfully well, thank you, Hilda. I'll just take a selection of vegetables. Uh, boiled potatoes and cabbage. That's the only selection we've got. And what on earth are you putting into your glass? Water, Hilda. Anything wrong? Nothing wrong with water. It's just... So unlike you, Rumpole. People should be sufficiently intoxicated with each other. Why do we also need artificial stimulants? It's very nice of you to say that, Rumpole. Do you notice a rather peculiar smell? It's an American fragrancy called Old Spice. I acquired a bottle from Alfredo's in Fetter Lane when I popped in for a haircut. A haircut? Also got a new hat from Locks. The old one was getting a bit frayed round the edges. <gasps> Rumpole, you did all this for me. Well... It turned into an unusual evening in the mansion flat. As we sat at the kitchen table, I felt Hilda's hand upon mine. And she was looking into my eyes with, well, with affection. There you are, Dorothy. Oh, everyone calls me Doc, Mr Erskine Brown. And everyone calls me Mr Erskine Brown. <clears throat> I, I'm glad you're here all alone, Dot. Are you Mr Erskine Brown? Uh, Dot, is there anything you'd like to tell me? But what would you like to know? I could tell you the time. It's one twenty-five precisely. You're young, Dot, and I'm sure this is uh, very embarrassing for you. But nowadays, well... Girls of your age are much more open about sex. Do you mind if I eat my egg and cress? Uh, not if it makes this easier for you. I'm sure you realise that men uh, do get these urges that come over them from time to time. I'll take your word for it. And, of course, you are an extremely attractive young lady. I'll do my best. I'm sure you do. The thing is, no man is entitled to show his feelings in the workplace. I agree with that, but get a short enough lunch break as it is. Uh, Dot, I I'd like you to feel that we don't have any secrets from each other. Really? You can trust me, and I want you to succeed in equity court. Perhaps rising from typist to junior clerk. Oh. And then, who knows? But f for your own sake, tell me what you feel. If you don't cooperate, we can't do anything about it. Now, why don't you just come into my room for a moment? I don't think so, Mr Erskine Brown. While these events were unfolding in our chambers, a more serious and terrible drama was taking place in the poorly decorated and underheated block near Warren Street Station, where the Castorini trio rented an overpriced rehearsal room. On each floor, reached by an antique lift, there were a number of rooms from which the sound of music was constantly emerging. The Castorinis had a room on the fifth floor. On the fourth, a room was rented by Peter Matheson, a horn player who'd been at college with Elizabeth. At about a quarter past six, 
on the evening of June the 28th, 1956, Matheson left his room as Desmond Castorini came down from the floor above. Hello there, Desmond. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Peter, can you help me? He seemed extremely agitated and said that something had happened to Tom Randall, the cellist. It, it's Tom. At that stage, it's Matheson Tom. noticed blood on Desmond's cuff. Is that blood? Oh. They went upstairs together and into the Castorini's rehearsal room. There, Matheson saw Tom Randall lying on the floor, his clothes blood-stained and his face drained of all colour. He had been shot through the heart. The police arrived on the scene at 25 minutes to seven. The body was removed to the mortuary and the room was searched, photographed and dusted for fingerprints. These proceedings were in the control of Detective Inspector Baker and Detective Sergeant Straw. It was Straw who found, in a space between the wall and the piano, an old Colt revolver from which one shot had recently been fired. Elizabeth and Desmond Castorini were playing a Brahms sonata in Red Lion Square when the police officers appeared behind the audience. No, no. Let's do this quietly, sir. Detective yes, sir. Inspector Baker arrested Desmond Castorini and I told him that he was charged with the murder of Thomas Paul Randall. After I read of the arrest in the Times, I tried to speak to Elizabeth. But there was just the sound of ringing in what I imagined to be an empty room and no reply. Three weeks went by and then she rang me in chambers. She wanted to see me urgently. I'd been wondering when I would see Elizabeth again and I was ashamed to find myself grateful to a murder for bringing us together. She brushed my cheek with her lips, mm. then took my arm Dear as she steered Oz. me into the park. You will look after Desmond, won't you? I've told him all about the marvellous way you handled Billy's case. Ah, yes, Billy's case. It still rang no bells with me. I want you. Really? To defend Desmond. Uh, oh, in that case, I really ought to send my favourite solicitor, Bonnie Bernard, to take instructions from your husband in prison. Whatever you say. Can we forget the legal business for a moment? I wanted to see you anyway. I've never felt so terribly alone. I'm sure. It's so wonderful to have you on our side. Now I know Desmond's going to be fine. I can only do my best. And that will be enough. Can we meet again? Soon? I'm afraid I'm not supposed to talk to witnesses. Oh, Horace. I got another kiss on the mm. cheek. Oh. more purposeful than the first, and then she walked quickly away. I watched her go, and kept on watching until she disappeared from view. One week later, I found myself in the interview room in Brixton Nick, with Bonnie on my left and across the bare wooden table, a pale and shaking Desmond Castorini. I've told the police everything I know. You must have read my statement. Of course we have. But uh, this message, for instance, written on a pad found by the telephone in your flat. Uh, Tom Rang wants to meet you at 6pm. Was the message addressed to you or to your wife? To me, obviously. Elizabeth wrote it. She'd hardly leave a note to herself. Did you think at this meeting at 6 p.m. Tom was going to tell you that he and your wife were lovers? No. It never crossed my mind. Prosecution are going to suggest that you shot Tom Randall in a fit of jealous rage, did you? I give you my word, Mr. Rumpole. Any other tensions between you? Financial? No. Elizabeth's always taking care of that. She has some money, you see, from when her Uncle Max died. He left her a couple of thousand, so we've always been okay. When your wife was at college, she said I had defended a man called Billy. Oh, yes, she told me all about that. She and Billy Palmer were friends with another student called Alberman. There was some business with a stolen violin. Stolen violin. Now, that does ring a bell. I know Alberman went to prison. 
But Billy got off thanks to your defence. Why don't I poke around in the archives, Mr Rumpel? See exactly what happened in that particular case. Oh, I doubt it'll help us at all. Elizabeth remembers I was an impressive advocate, that's the point. Even so, perhaps I should, really. I'd rather you looked into the background of the late Tom Randall. Go through his accounts, check his personal history for any possible enemies. The usual sort of stuff. If you're quite sure, Mr. Rumpel. I am, thank you, Mr. Bernard. Now, turning to the murder weapon, you kept a Colt revolver at home with ammunition. I was just looking after it for my dad. I never used it. So how did it come to be fired? How did it come to be left behind the piano in the rehearsal room? Your guess is as good as mine. I don't wish to guess, Mr. Castorini. On the day that Tom Randall died, you turned up at the rehearsal room at 6 p.m.? Yes. And then? Well, I started walking up the stairs. When you got to your room, was the door open? No, it was closed, but not locked. You found Tom Randall inside? Lying on the floor. I knelt down and felt his heart. And that's how I got blood on my shirt and hands. Yes, yes, and... that will be part of our defence. <clears throat> or possibly our entire defence. Mr Castorini, I'm sure you realise it's a difficult case... And we don't need to spell out the consequences if the jury find you... No, we don't need to spell out the consequences. I know I might hang, Mr. Rumpole, but I can rely on you. Elizabeth told me you're a wonderful man. Really? That was very kind of her. As Bonnie Bernard and I left Brixton, Nick, I tried not to think about Elizabeth... I reminded myself it was her husband who required my immediate attention. Mr. Bernard, have you ever known a villain leave his weapon at the scene of the crime? Oh, I suppose it's possible Mr. Castorini thought he'd hidden a pistol and intended to come back for it later. Mm. I mean, he couldn't walk out of the building with a gun in his hand, could he? No, I suppose not. I'm... I'm surprised you don't want to know more about the Billy Palmer case. Well, I doubt it's relevant, that's all. You're normally so keen to explore every avenue, Mr. Rumpel. Is there some reason you're not trying your hardest to defend Desmond Castorini? I shan't dignify that outrageous question with an answer, Mr. Bernard. The outrageous question was, in fact, a perfectly decent one. It took me a little while to answer it, honestly. Thankfully, Bonnie Bernard left no stone unturned. As my instructing solicitor began his investigation, my head of chambers neared the end of his own inquiry. Come. I fear I'm making very little progress. I... Oh. Hello, Rumpel. Erskine Brown. You were saying? Well, merely that Dot's giving little away about the propositions from which she's suffered. I can't get her to lodge a formal complaint. Can you not? Well, she's made a formal complaint to me. Has she? That's excellent. Excellent? I'm not so sure. Dorothy Clapton, to give Dot her full name, is extremely worried. Well, I'm not at all surprised. Henry's behaviour was unforgivable. Henry? She didn't say a word about Henry. But then who on earth is she complaining about? You! But Bella... She said only... you talked to her about terrible urges. No, I said I understood those urges. Since we all have them... Speak for yourself. And you promised to get her promoted to a junior clerkship. No doubt for a certain consideration. Oh, Ballard, that is a totally unjustified accusation. You never said it? Well, I may have said something like it, but what I meant... No, no, see... I want to be perfectly fair to you. I want to give you ample time to consider your defence. My defence? This will have to be decided at a full chamber's meeting. Until then, I hope you will have no further conversations with Miss Clapton. Well, really... After Claude had left in a state of indignation and dismay, Soapy Sam turned to me with an enigmatic question. You know what caused the decline and fall of the Roman Empire? I had to confess I couldn't quite remember. Lust, Rumpel. And flagrant immorality has reared its head all over this building. I will have to call on everyone to pull themselves together. I looked at the man. He was undoubtedly a pompous, blinkered, humorless prig. And yet I remembered what Elizabeth Castorini had told me I should feel about Sam. So I tried it out. I love you, Ballard. 
Was there? I love you with all my heart. I believe it's our duty to love everyone. And because of that, I can only say again, I love you, Ballard. I'd clearly gone too far and taken Elizabeth's advice too literally. Sam Ballard got up, extremely alarmed. Uh, another time, perhaps. I, I have to go. Moral of decay everywhere. <laughs> As the great proposition inquiry in Chambers came to a head, R. V. Castorini came to trial at the Old Bailey. The proceedings began in a routine manner with the medical evidence, and then Detective Sergeant Straw produced the revolver, which he had found in the rehearsal room. It was not very well concealed. Not particularly. And no fingerprints were found on the weapon? That is correct. Let us use our common sense about this, Mr. Rumpel. No doubt whoever did it removed the fingerprint so as to avoid detection. Does that make sense to you, members of the jury? I know it does to me. So is this your lordship's theory? My client was careful to leave his gun behind, although it could easily be traced to him, but took a lot of trouble clearing off the fingerprints? Or else wore gloves. Or else wore gloves. That's a possibility, isn't it, members of the jury? Mr. Castorini has agreed that the gun was his. Must have been mad to leave it at the scene of the crime, mustn't he? Mr. Rumpel, you know, we have a saying up north. There's no so queer as folk. Do you really, my lord? Down here, in the deep south, we're more inclined to look for some sort of logical explanation. After this preliminary skirmish... My opponent, Christopher Peake, a big, beefy QC with an unnervingly high voice, began to examine the horn player, Peter Matheson. And I just paused for a moment to empty out my valves when I heard them coming down the stairs. I'm sorry, Mr. Matheson, you heard who exactly? Tom Randall and Elizabeth Castorini. And you heard what they were saying? Oh, Tom was shouting. I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him, and there's only one way to stop me. I'm going to tell him... Uh, no doubt the him was Mr. Castorini, the lady's husband. My lord, there is no evidence to that effect. But we can use our common sense, can't we, Mr. Rumpole? Isn't this just another case of the eternal triangle? At the moment, all we know is that the three people most closely involved were a musical trio. A piano, a violin and a cello, nothing more. The judge, and I'm afraid the jury, looked a little sceptical. Nevertheless, I used my cross-examination of the horn player, Matheson, to try to inject some doubt into minds that were already made up. Did you hear a shot? No, I didn't. And did Desmond Castorini tell you straight away that he'd found Tom Randall dead and he'd no idea who did it? That's what he told me, yes. You said, I think, that you were at music college with members of the trio. Just Tom and Elizabeth. Desmond met them later. You knew Elizabeth well? At college, yes. I suppose I was a bit in love with her. Most men were. You can understand that, can't you? Uh, oh, you, you, you mustn't ask me questions. Especially not that question. It was far too close to something I'd been asking myself ever since my lunch with Elizabeth. Now was not the time to dwell on my inappropriate feelings for the young lady. Nor on my ambivalent feelings for she who must. In the kitchen, trying to work. You're probably wondering why there's nothing on the stove. Hmm. And nothing in the oven. That you are. Rumpo. Oh, what is it, Hilda? Have you even noticed what I'm wearing? <sighs> clothes? New clothes. A new dress. And shoes. But why? I thought you'd like them. I'm not sure they'd fit me. Fit your hat and coat. We're going out for supper. That's impossible. I've got this whole pile of papers to read tonight. Cut that weight. Bonnie Bernard has been going through the case of Billy Palmer with a fine tooth comb. It seems young Billy was one I wonderful. am not interested in your case, Rumpole. I am not interested in your clothes, Hilda. And what about me? The question hung there for a moment. And then she who must turned on her high heels and clicked away towards the bedroom. Hilda didn't stir when I rose early the next morning. 
I crept out of the flat and made my way to the old bailey, where at ten-thirty Christopher Peake, QC, announced that he was going to call Elizabeth Castorini as a witness for the prosecution. Where should I go? In as she entered the witness box, Elizabeth looked as beautiful as ever. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall... She smiled at her husband in the dock, the and he smiled back, confident, I'm sure, that she was there to help him. But if that was her purpose, she disguised it very well. Desmond was jealous, I think. Jealous of Tom and me, but for no reason at all. Jealous of Tom... And me. And how did that make you feel? Scared, of course. Desmond had that gun. Desmond had that gun. As Mr. Justice Oliphant wrote down every damning phrase, I prepared myself for a conversation with Elizabeth, not over a lunch table, but across a crowded courtroom. And my purpose wasn't to re-establish our friendship or to move past that stage into something far less innocent, but to destroy her credibility. I spoke to her quietly at first, with tenderness. I thought it the best technique, and I found it extremely easy. Mrs. Castorini, if I can take you back to your college days... Please do, Mr. Rumpo. Uh, a student was charged with theft... In your final year, I believe. David Alberman, that's right. The other three members of Alberman's string quartet were also charged. You know they were, don't you, Horace? I mean, Mr. Rumpo. She gave me a secret smile, which I'm afraid I didn't return. I may know all the details of the case, but the jury don't. Did you attend the trial of your fellow students? I did. I was a friend of the viola player, Billy Palmer. You defended Billy, and you were brilliant. I'm sure we can take that for granted. <laughs> Mr. Rumpole! But I don't wish to talk about my own performance. I want to hear about one of the other defendants, a Tom Cogswill, who gave evidence against Alberman. Tom Cogswill? Uh, uh, I'm not sure I remember. Oh, come now. Of course you do. Tom was the cellist in the string quartet. Alberman was the leader, playing on a violin lent to him by the college for a whole year. It was a violin made by Joseph Guaneri, worth about 3,000 guineas. But the violin that Alberman gave back to the college at the end of the year was a cheap imitation. Someone sold the Guaneri and replaced it with a fake. I don't know where you're going with this, Mr. Rumpole. If you keep your mouth shut and listen, you'll find out was what I should have said. It will all become clear very soon, my lord. Was what I did say. Alberman and the second violin player both went to prison, thanks to the evidence provided by the cellist, Tom Cogswell. But Billy Palmer walked free. Thanks to you, Mr. Rumpole, you are just so brilliant. Yes, yes, you keep saying that, but having reminded myself of the details of the case, I find, in fact, I did virtually nothing. Did... Virtually nothing. Billy Palmer had no idea that Alberman had swapped his expensive Guaneri violin for a cheap imitation. Billy was a viola player, almost incapable of hearing whether his own instrument was in tune, let alone whether someone else's violin sounded as good as it used to. Billy Palmer walked free because the jury believed he knew nothing about the theft. Tom Cogswell walked free because he helped the prosecution. Did you know Tom Cogswell? Not really. Even when he changed his name to Randall? Oh. Tom Randall. And joined your trio as the cellist. The cellist who was recently shot dead by someone. Could I have a glass of water? Please? In a minute, when I finished, your trio got very little work at first, am I right? We had to make a name for ourselves. Three paid concerts in the first year, four in the second, and yet you managed to rent an expensive rehearsal room, pay for food and clothing and petrol. I'd been left some money. Ah, yes, by your Uncle Max. It was so sad. He was such a lovely man. He died very young. Mr. I don't think he did. What on earth are you saying, Mr. Rumpel? I'm saying there was no Uncle Max. I've checked Mrs. Castellini's family tree. Uncle Max... 
did not exist. <laughs> then where did I get my money? You're really not supposed to ask me questions. However, on this occasion, I'll answer. I believe you got your money from the sale of a violin made by Joseph Guarneri. You were the mastermind behind the theft of that instrument. But David Alberman and the second violin player went to prison without grassing you up because, like so many men, they were both in love with you. This is outrageous, my lord! Yes, I would prefer to concentrate on this case. Not something that was dealt with some years ago, Mr. Rumpo. Even though the nature and the circumstances of that case are causally connected to this one, my lord? What? Tom Randall, the cellist from this crooked string quartet, knew all about Mrs. Castorini's involvement with the stolen violin, but he kept quiet. Why? Are you asking me or the witness, Mr. Rumpo? I am asking the witness if she paid Tom Randall 20 pounds every month. It seems from this that someone did. What have you got there? These are Tom Randall's bank statements. He got a regular payment, 20 pounds every month, from an anonymous source. Was that you? Was Tom Randall blackmailing you? Blackmailing me? For what possible reason? He was going to inform your husband that you stole the Gwenneri violin from your college. Then repeat that allegation to the police. Unless you paid him even more every month. No, no, that's nonsense. I'm going to tell him and there's only one way to stop me. <laughs> I'm much obliged, my lord. It seemed that Mr. Justice Oliphant was starting to see things from my point of view. The jury, too, were no longer smiling at Elizabeth. And I... I'm afraid that I was seeing her in quite a different light. On the day that Tom Randall died, what exactly did you do? I had a doctor's appointment at ten. I went to a lunchtime concert in Portland Place. I bought a dress, and I had a drink with our agent at six. But you popped back home before then. You wrote a note for your husband on the pad by the phone. No. Exhibit nine. A small piece of paper with a scribbled message. Tom rang, wants to meet you at 6 p.m. No. Did you telephone and arrange to meet Tom Randall at the rehearsal room at 5.30? No, I didn't. I think you did. And I think you went to the rehearsal room with your husband's gun. No, I told you. I had a drink with our agent at 6 at the Warren Street Hotel. Which is just around the corner from your rehearsal room. So you had plenty of time to shoot Tom, hide the gun somewhere the police would find it, then go out to the fire escape and down to the street. No, please, stop. Who had a motive for killing Tom Randall? Might it be someone who wanted to stop paying him blackmail money and also shut his mouth? Not me. It wasn't. My lord, Mr. Rumpole is putting a whole string of suppositions to this witness. He's accusing her of the very oh. crime for which his client is on trial. How can these questions be relevant? Because, my lord, if the jury thinks someone else might be guilty, my client can't be convicted. I'm fully entitled to put these suppositions to the witness. Or does your lordship want me to argue the matter in the court of appeal? No, no. Let's use our common sense about this. No need to bother the court of appeal, is there? You go on at your own risk. I shall indeed, my lord. Why did you come here as a witness? The police asked me to attend. But you knew you couldn't be compelled to give evidence against your husband. They must have told you that. So you came here of your own free will. I wanted to tell you the truth. Or you wanted to make sure your husband got convicted for a crime that you committed? Oh. You told your husband to brief a barrister you hoped wouldn't attack you. A barrister who'd give you an easy ride. A barrister who might actually fall in love with you. Like almost every other man you've ever met. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Was what I thought, but did not say. My short, happy, but misguided friendship with Elizabeth Castorini was over. She left the witness box and the court, and I never saw her or spoke to her again. Three days later, her husband also left the court, sad, confused, but acquitted. Not long after the jury's verdict, Detective Sergeant Straw interrupted Elizabeth's practice to arrest her and charge her with the murder of Tom Randall. 
In spite of her high opinion of my brilliance, she did not call upon me to defend her. So my life returned to normal, which meant yet another Chambers meeting. This one was to reach a final verdict on the matter of the propositioning of Dorothy Dot Clapton. Erskine Brown was, unwisely, I thought, conducting his own defence. I heard Henry going on and on about her modestly hidden breasts and the swishing sound made by her stockings. No doubt you did, but... Uh, Rumpole, this is my inquiry. Yes, but I have investigated the matter, so with your lordship's permission... Uh, this really... Erskine Brown, have you ever heard of Miss Mildred Hannay? Miss Mildred... No, I don't think so. Have you forgotten that Henry is a thespian, a star of the Bexley Heath players? Dot Clapton is also a native of Bexley Heath with a taste for the stage. That ghastly dialogue about stockings and breasts was not Henry's, but the product of the fevered brain of the aforementioned Miss Mildred Hannay, a local author who has written a play especially for the group. What you had the misfortune to hear, Erskine Brown, was a rehearsal. Any further questions? <laughs> A chop? Actually, a chop would be most welcome. Thank you. A pork chop made with meat from a pig? Mm, yes, please. Ah. You've given up on being a vegetarian. Mm, the last vegetarian I met was a teetotaler and a murderer. I'm not sure which was worse. No American fragrancy this evening. Nor ever again. What came over your rumpole when you started to smell so exotic? I met a lady in the Meads, full beautiful, a fairy's child. I suppose you're talking about Elizabeth Castorini. La belle dame sans merci had us in her thrall. Uh, us! <sighs> Do you still have that dress? The new one. Of course. And the shoes? Why? I thought perhaps we should go out for supper. Not tonight, obviously, but later this week. Would you like another chop, Rumpole? Thank you, Hilda. Hmm. You were never a fairy's child, were you? That's one thing to be said in your favour, old darling. In Rumpole and the Eternal Triangle by John Mortimer, the elder Horace Rumpole was played by me, Timothy West, and the younger Horace Rumpole was Benedict Cumberbatch. Hilda Rumpole was Cathy Sarah, Claude Erskine Brown, Nigel Anthony, Elizabeth Castorini, Faye Castello, and Desmond Castorini was Adrian Scarborough. Sam Ballard was Michael Cochran, Bonnie Bernard, Matthew Morgan, Sir Oliver Oliphant, Geoffrey Whitehead, and Christopher Peake was Stephen Critchlow. Other parts were played by members of the company. Rumpole and the Eternal Triangle was adapted by Richard Stoneman, directed by Marilyn Imrie, and is a Catherine Bailey production for BBC Radio 4. Rumpole and the Family Pride by John Mortimer, adapted by Richard Stoneman. With me, Timothy West, as the elder Horace Rumpole, and Benedict Cumberbatch as the younger Horace Rumpole. Father! Father! Come quickly! When I've had my breakfast. Body. There's a body in the lake. Jonathan, if this is yet another an old, of your... An, an old lady. She's dead. That old lady was about to lead young Rumpole up north to Yorkshire. It was a rare excursion from my London haunts, and one which I remember to this day, despite the many years that have passed. 
I dare say Lord Richard Sackbutt, if he is still alive, will never forget the sight of the drowned corpse floating in his lake that morning. I'm sure it was enough to put his lordship off his breakfast. Three weeks later, my own breakfast was about to be interrupted, though in slightly less dramatic circumstances. Oh, do look at this tragic picture, Rumpo. Despite being married for only a few years, Hilda and I had already fallen into the habit of conducting the first meal of the day in semi-silence. Semi in the sense that I remained silent, while Hilda insisted on reading out titbits from such fascinating journals as Coronet magazine. It's Lady Fiona Armstead. Her romance with Robin French Uffington is over. Unable to feign interest of any kind, I replied with a comment on the committal papers I was reading for a case in the Thames Magistrate's Court. Mr. Wally Wilkinson has confessed to the murders of three young men in Southwark. Lord Luxter's put on weight. Oh, please, Hilda, do you actually know any of these people? You can read all about them in Debbie's diary. You can read all about them. I have no intention of ever doing so. Well, you should, Rumpole. Then you might learn about gracious living. You might lose the habit of blowing on your tea to cool it down. I'm in a hurry. Do you expect me to fan my tea with my hat? No, I expect... Oh, look. It's Sackbut Castle. Is it really? How fascinating. The 17th Baron Sackbut occupies the private wing with his second wife, Rosemary, nay Whiston. Whiston, Rumpo. Whiston. Am I supposed to know this woman? You do know a uh, Whiston. Do I? I'm sure I remember. What's my name? She who must... I mean, Hilda. Hilda what? Hilda Rumpole, since we got married. Oh, and before that? Oh, I see. It was Whiston. Your Hilda, nay, Whiston. Whiston once was no more. I knew Rosemary would turn up in the coronet sooner or later. She's the youngest child of Hungerford Whiston and my first cousin, once removed. And now she's all over the coronet. Isn't that so very exciting, Rumpole? I'll try to get Wally released. Ah, no blood stains on his clothes. I think I can get my teeth in blue. I'm sure no one at Sackbert Castle eats breakfast wearing a hat. In the far-off days of 1956, there were hats aplenty in the canteen of the Thames Magistrates' Court. Even my colleague from Chambers, Liz Probert, kept her wig on as she sipped her cup of coffee. Oh, come on, Rumpole. You're not going to object, are you? If I'm on my feet, I'll probably be objectionable in some way or another. On what grounds can you possibly apply for Wally's release? Ask not what I'm going to do, Miss Probert. Just watch me in court. I fought that committal for three days in court, but I knew it was a hopeless case. After Wally was sent for trial, I came out of court to find a victorious Liz Probert sitting on a bench in the entrance hall, looking rather disconsolate. I tried to cheer her up. Bravo! You won the day. Next step, the old Bailey. I suppose so. <sighs> a sad little sigh was not what I was used to from this radical Welsh firebrand. I inquired after her ongoing, offgoing boyfriend. Have you seen Dave Inchcape lately? We're co-defending in a fray together, and I'd like I to... no idea where Dave bloody Inchcape is. You'll have to find him yourself. Liz, what on earth's the matter? Absolutely nothing's the matter. <laughs> oh, you, you, you don't usually burst into tears when you win a case. Oh, why should you assume I burst into tears? Because I'm a woman? No, it's more to do with the fact that you have actually burst into tears. <laughs> Has something happened between you and Dave? Oh, if I'm upset, it must be about a man. Men are the only things women have got to be upset about, aren't they? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, it is about Dave Bloody Inchcape. 
What's he done now? It's not what he's done, it's what he is. Secretly married? That I could cope with. This? Well, it's too awful for words. Mr. Rumpel, sir. What is it, Constable? It's your wife. Oh, God, where? On the phone. Oh, thank heavens. Uh, you'll be all right oh, if I... Don't worry about me, Rumpel. But I did worry about Liz Probert and Dave Bloody Inchcape. Even as I listened to She Who Must Be Obeyed on the telephone in the police room. Rosemary, my cousin, once removed. You remember, I told you about Rosemary. Well, she wants us to pop up for the weekend to Sackbut Castle. <laughs> Three weeks ago, when Lord Richard Sackbutt and his second wife, Rosemary, followed young Jonathan through the grounds of the castle, they found the body of an elderly woman face down in the lake. A large string bag was attached to her wrist. Photographs taken at the scene showed a broad-cheeked face which might once have been pretty. The police, the ambulance, the pathologist and Lord Sackbutt gathered at the castle where they were joined by Dr. Hugo Swaby, the local coroner. Good morning, my lord. I thought it best to get my inquiries going as soon as possible. Have you seen the body? Of course I have, Swaby. My son found the woman dead. He called me out of the lake. What more do you need? I'm afraid I need to know if it's anyone you recognise. Of course it's not. Stupid bloody question. Sackbud Castle was built to defend a large area of North Yorkshire. It had been besieged three times during the Wars of the Roses. After that, it remained peaceful, until the 17-year-old Jonathan Sackbutt, on holiday from Eton, took the family Labrador for an early run by the lake. As we staggered from the taxi into the main hall of Sackbutt Castle, an attendant stepped forward. Leave your luggage there. The rest of the party's gone upstairs. We climbed the wide stone staircase and found ourselves in a great hall with narrow windows. Bare of furniture except for suits of armour, brutal-looking weapons arranged in great circles on the walls. In the distance, we saw a group of people and a man in a dark suit who was waving to us. Over here, my party! Why is he calling us my party, Rumpo? All right, everybody. So... Uh, looking through here, you'll get a good view of the East Tower. Is the family about? I'm sorry, madam? Are they here? The Sackbutts? Um, well, I believe Lord and Lady Sackbutt are in residence at the moment. Uh, they occupy the East Wing, which was built in 1592. This way, Rumpel. Madam, no! That part of the castle is not open to the public. We are not the public. <gasps> In a drawing room upstairs, high windows opened onto the terrace of the castle. A pale boy was sitting alone in a window seat, reading a book. Hello. We are the Rumpoles. I believe Rosemary is expected. She's not here. There's only me. Are you Jonathan? Well, I'm Hilda Rumpole, and this is my husband. Horace Rumpole, pleased to meet you. I'm Rosemary's cousin. Once removed. So we're related. You and I, in, in, in a manner of... Hilda! Is that you? Oh, Rosemary, there you are. Oh, hello. Oh, and, and, and you must be Horace. I fear I have no alternative. Oh, Jonathan, I, I hope you've been entertaining the Rumpole. Not really. I'm going to my room trying to get some privacy. Ah. <gasps> Sorry about it, Jonathan. Let's see if we can't rustle up some refreshments. Oh, <laughs> You know, Rosemary, it was so funny when we arrived. They treated us like members of the public. W wasn't it funny, Rumpole? Hilarious. Uh, would you like a cup of tea, Horace? Only if you have nothing in the nature of a bottle of red. Rumpole! No, no, Hilda. Let Horace have a drink, if he needs one. You must be exhausted after all those splendid cases you do. Splendid cases? Daddy saw you in action at the Old Bailey, said you were absolutely superb. Well, I can be rather magnificent that time. Daddy told us in the courtroom nobody dares say boo to a rub pole. Hmm. In the courtroom, perhaps? <laughs> Sake, 
Will this do? Uh, no, of course it won't. A bow tie is not supposed to dangle from your neck at an angle of 45 degrees. Does it really matter? Of course it matters. We have to look our best. But why, Hilda? Because everyone else will look their best. They're all dressed for dinner. We're in a castle rump hole. Are we really? I hadn't noticed. <sighs> Lord Plunger Plumstead's coming. Why Plunger? Does he dive? <laughs> He lost all his money on the stock exchange, nearly threw himself off the top of St Paul's. Really, Rumpole, you ought to keep up with what's going on with these people. What was going on with these people, apparently, was that no one apart from us had dressed for dinner. Lord Sackbutt had finally appeared and turned out to be a man in his late forties whose long chin, gingery hair and blue eyes were echoed in all the family portraits we'd seen around the castle. For some reason, he seemed extremely glad to see me. It really is jolly sporting of you to come all the way to Yorkshire to offer me some free advice. Advice? Free advice, yes. Of course, there'll be opportunities for fun and games, too. I shan't keep you away from my chums all the time. Hmm. His chums were a rum-looking bunch. Lord Plunger Plumstead devoured his food as if he hadn't eaten for days. His wife, Mercia, appeared to be embalmed and never spoke. Tarquin and Helen Yarraby talked in very loud voices about people I didn't know and of sports of which I had no experience. Just so Adolfo wouldn't win. Towards the end of dinner, they began to discuss the local coroner, Dr. Hugo Swaby. He's enjoying every moment of this business. Best thing that ever happened to the ghastly little man. Plunger was not a fan of Dr. Swaby. You should see him out hunting, Rumble. Looks like a dog's dinner. As does the poor fox, I imagine. Did you hear, Mr. Rumpole, about the accident in the lake? Oh, yes, yes, Helen. That's why he's here. Some old woman managed to drown herself. Is Swaby going to be a pain in the neck about that? <laughs> he wants to get his name in the papers. He thinks he'll discover all sorts of things. It's a bore. I don't see how you can be held responsible for anything, old man. I mean, most people have some kind of lake, don't they, Rumble? Ours is rather small. Living as we do in the Gloucester Road, it's more of a puddle. Really? Perhaps the lady should leave us to our port now. <coughs> mm. I say, Rumble, can you get your gamekeepers to eat rook? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't have any gamekeepers or rooks come to that. But you have a place in Gloucester. Actually, no, we have but a... Place... Rosemary was telling me you've had some success with your cases. I suppose I have acquired a certain reputation around the cells of Brixton. And some of your cases concern dead people. Contrary to popular belief, dead people can tell you quite a lot. Can they? Can they really? From his distant gaze, I could see Lord Sackbutt was preoccupied with thoughts. Thoughts of what? Nothing he felt he could share with the likes of me. But I wondered, why ever not? Oh, Rumpole, can't you hang your trousers in the wardrobe rather than leaving them on the floor? I have no time to waste, Hilda. Any moment now I might freeze to death. Where are my pyjamas? On oh, the chair behind you. Oh. 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 Are you going to join me? God knows, I need some kind of bodily warmth. Bunch up, then. Oh. You just lie there in the middle. <sighs> oh. Oh. I wonder what's planned for tomorrow. A shooting party, perhaps? Or an alfresco? Have you not yet grasped why we're here, Hilda? We've been invited to this underheated, over-decorated pile so that I, Horace Rumpole can provide legal service gratis, pro bono, and free of charge to Lord Richard Sackbutt. Nonsense. Oh, you're forgetting that Rosemary and I are cousins. Once removed. We are here to enjoy ourselves, Rumpole. Are we? In the morning, yes. Now, lights out and go to sleep. The next morning, with nothing much to do as I waited for my first conference with his lordship, I looked around the house. At the end of the row of family portraits, I saw the image of a man identical to our host, clearly Richard's father, a long-chinned, blue-eyed, gingery-haired army officer. I returned down the passage to the part of the castle open to the public. Hello, I'm uh, Hugo Swaby, Doctor 
Hugo Swaby. I believe we met Mr. Rumpole. Did we? You came up to Leeds for that stabbing in the old people's home. I was an expert witness. Oh, yes, you were indeed a witness. You gave some extraordinary evidence on the direction of the knife wounds. Thank you very much. You're staying with the Sackbutts, I gather. To tell the truth, I've never been invited to the other side of that door, though I do ride with the hunt, and I'm pretty well known in the neighbourhood. So, his lordship invited you to stay? Actually, it was his wife. No, it must have been his lordship. Women don't make decisions in the Sackbutt clan. Are you here for the old lady? I'm sorry? The one who tumbled into the lake. My office is taking statements as we speak. I thought I'd wander round, soak up the castle atmosphere. You're not here to see my client. Oh, is his lordship your client? This will be exciting. I think I'll be able to offer you a few surprises. Such as? The dead woman's possessions contain some old clothes, an empty gin bottle, and a purse, the contents of which were rather interesting. In what way? Apart from a return train ticket to London, which suggests she wasn't local, there was also a photograph taken on the terrace of this very castle. An old photograph. Shows a woman holding a baby next to a man in uniform. No doubt who the man was, Lord Sackbutt's father. Now, how do you imagine the dead woman got hold of that photograph, Mr. Rumpole? I had no idea. And as I inspected the lake the next morning, I was not given much help by Lord Sackbutt. Why call on my expert services for a case in which an old lady simply slipped and drowned in your grounds? Sad, but hardly a threat to your peace of mind. We're open to the public. They might think we're not safe. Oh, nonsense. What's the real problem? What's making Dr. Swaby, the Grand Inquisitor of Weldyke, so excited? <clears throat> it's starting to rain. We'd better get back to the castle. My client said nothing more about Dr. Swaby or the old lady. He just promised me a treat for the afternoon. A dog show, a tombola, and other delights in the castle grounds. It sounded like a fate worse than death. A comment that I kept to myself as I left Lord Sackbutt and approached his son in the drawing room. Tinkled like iron, while far distant hills into the tumult sent an alien sound. Jonathan was alone, as usual, sitting on his window seat with a book. While the stars eastward were sparkling clear and in the west... The orange sky of evening died away. You like that? Well, the sound of it, yes. I like the sound of it very much. Well, it's worth. I know. I sat at the fireside in front of a big coffee table piled high with photograph albums. You live here in the holidays with your father? Yes. See much of your mother? Your real mother, I mean, not Rosemary. No. No. Ah, now look at this. Here's a photograph of someone I assume to be your grandfather. Looks just like your father. But why all these blank pages? These torn out photographs, these attempts to hide something or someone? I don't know what you're talking about. The stalls and tents of the fate were set out on a patch of grass under the east tower. She who must had gone off to buy a huge selection of jams, and I was chatting to Rosemary. Young Jonathan, I gather he doesn't see much of his mother. Richard thinks it's best if he doesn't. She married again, someone quite ghastly. Who was that? Oh, a rather fat little man who sold cars for a living. Cars? How awful. I know. They have a small house in Croydon or somewhere equally impossible. I mean, can you imagine that? Croydon, after living here in the castle. Rosemary! Oh, Bunty, hello. Oh, would you excuse me for a moment, Horace? Of course. Oh, Bunty, I'm so happy to be here. 
come a long rum pole. I've just seen a shirtless man with a grey, long-haired Yorkshire terrier. His chest looks identical. Identical to what? The Yorkshire terrier, of course. She's alive and well and living in Croydon. Who is? Richard's first wife. I knew it wasn't her they found in the lake. The dead body was far too oh, old. Do to be... look at that ugly woman with the Pekingese. She deserves to go home with something. In the end, the prize went to Plunger and his bull terrier. Jolly well done, sir. Yes, yes, no need to make a fuss. No, oh, I think we should. Raise a glass, toast your success. Mm. That beer tent over there looks like a suitable venue for a quiet celebration. Amazing the way dogs can look so much like their owners. Quite. <clears throat> In the same way men grow up to be reproductions of their fathers. Yeah, you think so? Well, I suppose Richard is the spitting image of his father. <laughs> Did you know Richard's mother? Hmm. She'd always seemed a perfectly nice woman. A bit affected, perhaps. I remember she used to call Richard Le Petit Richard. The <laughs> sort of funny French accent. What was her name, Richard's mother? Uh, uh, Margaret, yes. Uh, we called her Maggie. And what happened to Maggie? Uh, Maggie? Oh, she died. I suppose I must have been nine. After dinner that night, Rosemary and Hilda left the men to sip some sickly port by ourselves. The message came through. The headmaster wants to see you in his study after prayers. He told me to close the door, sit down, and then... I'm afraid your mother's dead. Did your headmaster or your father tell you how your mother died? No. I heard vague rumours that she might have gone to France, and then she just passed away. You believed your father? that your mother was dead? Of course. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how old she'd be now, if she'd lived? I suppose... late sixties? Much like the lady in the lake. What? Did it never occur to you that your mother might try to get in touch one day? What do you mean? Come back from the dead? If she really is dead. Of course she's dead. For a while, I feared my questions had offended Lord Sackbutt. But only a week later, he appeared in London with his wife in tow and insisted on taking She Who Must to the opera. Despite my objections, I was forced to join the party in Covent Garden. I turned up in blazer and grey flannels. The Sackbutts were, of course, in evening dress. I say, Rumpo, mm. I think I've got a young relative in your chambers. David Luxter. His grandfather was Lord Chancellor and his father's my cousin. I'm afraid we have no one called uh, Luxter in chambers. Oh. Ah, uh, he did an odd thing. Didn't want to rely on his grandfather's reputation, so he went into the law under an alias. He found a name he rather liked in some poem or other. Uh, something about a bell and a rock. Not the Inchcape rock. That's the one. Inchcape. Dave Inchcape. Born the son of a lord? No wonder Liz Probert, that despiser of all things aristocratic, felt betrayed. Mr. Cursiter had been the Sackbutt family solicitor for 38 years. When I spoke to him on the telephone, the timbre of his voice suggested he hadn't enjoyed a single one of them. Tell me, Mr. Cursiter, were you ever privy to information that confirmed the death of Lord Sackbutt's mother? Yes. When the previous Lord Sackbutt died, if Richard's mother had still been alive, would you have expected her to make some claim against the estate? Oh, no. Lord Sackbutt, Richard's father, started divorce proceedings long before his wife ran off with her man friend. Oh, I see. The case went through undefended. Oh. When Lord Sackbutt died, if Richard's mother had been alive, which she wasn't, she had no claim to anything. Uh, who was this man friend she ran off with? Some kind of waiter. Oh. French. There were rumours they were living in Paris. Paris? Rumours he died, rumours Richard's mother came back to England. Hmm. 
But that's all they were. Just rumours. Even so, Mr. Cursiter, I wonder if you'd be so kind as to place an advertisement for me in the Times. And the Daily Telegraph. Deceased in situ and then post-mortem. I concluded there was no sign... In a coroner's court, the coroner calls for witnesses and asks the questions. If I can just stop you there for a moment, Dr Malkin. Dr Swaby was putting a pathologist called Malkin through his paces. Can you please use layman's language? I was merely trying to say that the deceased, the dead woman, was in her late 60s or early 70s in poor general health... I came to the conclusion that death was probably caused by a blow to the head with some blunt instrument before the body entered the water. I didn't think it was a case of death by drowning because there was no water in the lungs. Might death have been caused by a deliberate attack, a blow to the head by some assailant? I thought it might. Struck before the body was put into the lake? Yes which would make this an unlawful killing, or, to use a word with which the jury might be more familiar, murder. I couldn't rule out that possibility. Mr Rumpel, Mm. do you wish to apply to ask the pathologist a question? A good many questions, as a matter of fact. Then I shall grant your application. How very generous, sir. Mm. Dr Malkin, in the case of drowning... It's possible for death to occur immediately due to a sudden cardiac arrest. It's happened in the case of people falling off ships, yes? I believe it has happened, yes. Such deaths have often occurred with drunken sailors. They fall off the deck and the alcohol produces a state of hypersensitivity to sudden and unexpected contact with water. It may do so. The dead lady in question had an almost empty bottle of gin in her possession. Mm. Yes. So it remains a possibility, does it not, that she met her death by drowning? It is... A possibility, yes. Dealing with a blow to the head, this was a particularly steep bit of bank with a number of branches and tree stumps, on some of which traces of blood were found. Yes. Can you rule out the possibility that this old lady, having drunk rather more gin than was good for her, slipped and fell into the lake, striking her head on one of those tree stumps as she fell? I, uh, I can't rule that out altogether. Thank you seems at last we have reached a sensible interpretation of the facts. Dr Dr. Malkin, we gather from your evidence that this blow to the head might have been accidental or it might have been deliberate. Is that right? Quite right, sir. You, of course, didn't go into the circumstances in which someone might have had a motive for causing the death of this old lady. I object to that question. How can Dr Malkin possibly answer it? He can't, Mr Rumpel. That will be the subject of the next part of my investigation, and I know you will wish to help me with it. Dr Malkin, thank you. We would now like to ask Mr Saggers a few questions. Mr Saggers was the attendant at the west gate of Sackbutt Castle, who took charge of our luggage when we first arrived. He was a solid Yorkshire man, clearly reliable, and he turned out to be a devastating witness. Mr Saggers... The lady in that photograph, do you recognise her at all? I do recognise the lady, Your Worship. The day before they found her, she came up to the castle entrance and asked to go inside. I asked her for the entrance fee. She said she'd got no money and his lordship would want to see her for free. So I told her to bugger off. And did she? What? Did she depart? I saw her walking away, yes. At what time? That past three, just before my tea break. Then, as I was passing the formal gardens, I saw them. You saw who? The old lady and his lordship. What were they doing? Just talking. I watched for a bit, then I went in for my tea. Very sensible. Have you any questions, Mr Rumpole? If you'd be so kind as to allow a further application. Of course. I really am much obliged. Mr Saggers, before you went for your tea break, how long did you see those two people together? Half a minute. Could you actually see Lord Sackbutt's face? Could you see it clearly? It was definitely his lordship. Would you at least accept the possibility that you might have been mistaken? No, Mr Rumpole. I won't accept that possibility. I know what I saw. Preparing for bed in Sackbutt Castle, 
I voiced my fears to she who must. Richard's going to lie in court tomorrow. I think he spoke to the old lady by the lake, but he's going to say he didn't. Richard wouldn't do that. Why not? Because he's a lord, because he lives in a castle. People have been telling lies here since the Wars of the Roses. Telling lies and locking up their wives or tearing their wives' photographs out of the family albums. Behaving like that because... because their fathers behaved like that. Finished? Good. Lights out. And nothing but the truth, so help me God. Lord Sackbot, having sworn to tell the truth, I wonder if you'd like to start by describing to us your first meeting with the deceased. Hmm. First time I saw the old girl was after her body was dragged from the water. So Mr. Saggers was lying? I'm not saying that. Mr. Saggers said you were talking to the old girl in the grounds of the castle. He was mistaken. The jury will have to make up their minds who's telling the truth on that point. Lord Sackbot, your father left your mother when you were just a young boy. I failed to see the relevance... Mr. Rumpole, I think this is relevant and indeed might have a great deal to do with the case. Lord Sackbot, did your father tell you that your mother was dead? Yes. Why? Because she was dead. But how did you know that? Because my father said so. He told my headmaster. Did it ever occur to you that your father was so angry with your mother, who was conducting an affair with a French waiter, that he pretended she died? It didn't occur to me that my father would ever tell a lie, no. Are you unaware there have been many rumours in your family and in the town that your mother did not die, as your father said, but until quite recently was alive and well and living in Paris? I never heard such rumours. Anyway, they would have been untrue. This is becoming intolerable. Lord Sackbutt's here to give evidence, not to deal with tittle-tattle. Please don't excite yourself, Mr Rumpole. Can we look at the photograph, Exhibit 3, showing Lord Sackbutt's father in uniform sitting on the castle terrace with a woman and a baby? We have heard evidence that this photograph was found in the string bag attached to the wrist of the lady in the lake. Shall we look at this exhibit, Your Lordship? If we must. Is that the terrace of Sackbutt Castle? Yes. And is the man in uniform your father? It is my father. There's also a woman with a baby. Is that woman your mother? I... I really can't say. You mean you can't remember what your own mother looked like? No. Not very clearly, no. I suggest to you that this is a family group. Your father, your mother and yourself as a very young child. I... I suppose that's a possibility. Or a probability. Can you tell the jury why the old lady who drowned had that photograph in her possession when she came to visit Sackbuck Castle? How on earth can my client answer that question? Perhaps, Mr Rumpole, he could deduce that the lady Lord Sackbutt's father said was dead was one and the same with the lady they fished out of the lake. What? In a fit of wounded pride, Lord Sackbutt's father made out that his wife had died. I object to that. There is not a scrap of evidence Oh, but there is, Mr Rumpole. There is a photograph. So, let me put this final point to his lordship. My lord, if this lady was the dowager Lady Sackbutt, she'd hardly be a welcome visitor at the castle, would she? After all that time, she'd come, no doubt, with a claim for money. Did it occur to you, my lord, that she might be better dead, as your father had wished so many, many years ago? No. His lordship rejected the not. suggestion entirely, but sadly, I had the feeling the jury hadn't warmed to Lord Sackbutt. In the middle of the afternoon, though, the family solicitor, Mr. Cursiter, told me that he had some interesting news, and I asked Dr. Swaby to adjourn the case until the next morning. Mr. Rompole, you've asked me to take the evidence of this witness, Mrs... Percier. Mrs. Percier, but I have no idea what light, if any, she can shed on this case. Then let me assist you, sir. Mrs. Percier is here now, so let her come in and give evidence. The door of the courtroom opened, and a woman dressed in black, fair hair touched in grey, 
entered the witness box. It may help us all if I explain straight away that Percier was not always the surname of this witness. What was your name before you married Mr. Percier, Mrs. Percier? It was Lady Sackbert. <gasps> and your son is... Richard, uh, the current Lord Sackbert. Am I supposed to understand that this lady is your client? His mother, sir. I still don't know what evidence she can give. Then perhaps it might be best if I carried on. I think the story should become clear. Even to you, old darling. Very well, Mr. Rumpole, you may carry on. <clears throat> Mrs. Percier, am I right in thinking it's been quite a few years since you last saw your son, Richard? I'm afraid so, yes. When Monsieur Percier was alive, I think you lived in Paris? My husband and I ran a small hotel there. When he died a few years ago, I sold it and came back to England. To where in England? To London. I live in Bloomsbury. Hmm. In front of you, there's a small bundle of papers and photographs. Would you be so kind as to glance at Exhibit 5, a photograph of a woman? This one? You have it. Good. Since you lived in Bloomsbury, I believe you've been involved with the Salvation Army. I do what I can. Some money, a little time, nothing very much. But you've helped to find beds for people with no homes to go to. A few. Including the woman in the photograph you're holding? Yes. That's Bertha. Bertha? When I first met her, she was sleeping at the back of Waterloo Station. I let her stay with me one night when we couldn't find her a bed anywhere else in London. She told me about her husband... A builder. He went to prison for fraud. And I told her about Sackbut Castle and my son. I'm not sure why I did that. This Bertha, she stayed the night in your house and left the next morning? Yes. I never saw her again. Was anything missing when she left? Actually, yes. A photograph... I'd shown it to Bertha when we were talking that first... that only night. I kept it in a desk. When Bertha left, the photograph went with her. I was very cross with her for stealing that. I understand. Could you now look at Exhibit 3, near the front of your bundle? <clears throat> and can you tell me if that's the photograph you lost to Bertha all those years ago? I think... <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think it is the same photograph. Who are the people in the group? Uh, my first husband, myself, uh, and Richard when he was a baby. Did Richard ever hit you over the head with a blunt instrument and push you into a lake? Of course not. <laughs> Though I wouldn't have blamed him if he'd wanted to. <laughs> After that, Dr. Swaby couldn't think of very much to ask Madame Percier. The inquest was virtually over, and the verdict inevitable. She who must read all about it in the Times and the Telegraph. The jury in the Sackbut Castle inquest returned a verdict of accidental death. Mm. But you said Richard was lying in court. Oh, I'm pretty sure Bertha waylaid him in the garden, told him she had some news, asked for money. He sent her away. She went back towards the castle full of gin, unsteady on her pins. Splosh. Or perhaps Richard had a secret fear that Bertha was his mother. But that would mean his father was a liar. So he pretended he didn't have the faintest idea who she was. That wasn't very nice. People aren't very nice, especially if they're lords. Luckily, his real mother reads the Daily Telegraph. Luckily? I tell you, I got Richard's solicitor to put an advert in the personal column. Le Petit Richard wants to see his maman very urgent. Oh, poor woman. Mm. The Rumpole residence? Ah, Miss Probert, how are you today? Oh, really? Why is that? The call was from Liz Probert. I see. She was off to court early and wanted to let me know that the prosecution was offering no evidence against Wally Wilkinson. Well, thanks for letting me know. Um, can I buy you a drink this evening? There's something I'd like to discuss. Yes? Oh, good. See you then. Oh, 
Rumpole, I don't think we'll go back to Sackbut Castle. Hilda, I don't think we'll be invited. <laughs> Here we are, Liz. Oh, no champagne? I think some Chateau Thames embankment should suffice. Oh, aren't we celebrating your client's acquittal? We are discussing your boyfriend, Dave Bloody Inchcape. He's my ex-boyfriend, and I've absolutely nothing to say about the bastard. Liz, I'm aware of his alias, the Honourable David Luxter. The Honourable? It's disgusting when there's kids in my old village walking to school without shoes. And you think the Honourable David Luxter had it easy? Of course he did. You're wrong. He was cursed with having Lord Luxter as a grandfather. David was a deprived child. Oh, <laughs> what? They're all deprived, Liz. All the lords and ladies and marquises of whatnot, they turn their sons out of the home at a tender age. They put them into the care of some sort of borstal like Eton. They lie to them and tell them their mothers are dead. The dice are loaded against the young of the upper crust. Maybe they are. Dave needs your support, your help, your love. In a sense, I suppose, he has been deprived. Life. It's not really fair, is it, Rumpole? <laughs> Liz, have you only just realised? Fair seed time had my soul and I grew up fostered alike by beauty and by fear. Much favoured in my birthplace. You drunk already, Rumpel? I'm reciting Wordsworth, a favourite poet of the Honourable Jonathan Sackbutt, a boy born into wealth and privilege with as much chance of finding true happiness as, well, as the rest of us poor salt. <laughs> Cheers. In Rumpole and the Family Pride by John Mortimer, the elder Horace Rumpole was played by me, Timothy West, and the younger Horace Rumpole was Benedict Cumberbatch. Jonathan Sackbutt was played by Joshua Maguire, Lord Richard Sackbutt, Julian Wadham, Hilda Rumpole, Cathy Sarah, and Liz Probert was Elaine Claxton. Dr. Swaby was Adrian Scarborough, Rosemary Sackbutt, Sophie Thompson, Lord Plunger Plumstead, Stephen Critchlow, Dr. Malkin, Geoffrey Whitehead, and Mrs. Percier was Susan Woolridge. Other parts were played by members of the company. Rumpole and the Family Pride was adapted by Richard Stoneman, directed by Marilyn Imrie, and is a Catherine Bailey production for BBC Radio 4. The Old Familiar Faces by John Mortimer with Desmond Barrett as Horace Rumpole. I, Horace Rumpole, barrister at law, criminal defender, well, that is to say I'm not, of course, myself a criminal. Not at all. I defend people about whom it's suggested they might have committed crimes. I, a rumpel of the Bailey, an old Bailey hack, tormentor of judges, thorn in the flesh of prosecutors, attorney general to the Timpson family, who live, on the whole, respectably, on the windy side of the law. I am here to announce quite honestly that I have no rooted objection to Christmas. It is, however... A period when time hangs heavy on the hands. The old Baileys close for the holidays. The better class of villain is taking a winter break on the Costa del Crime. <laughs> I think my real objection to Christmas is that no one is being tried for anything. There was one Christmas, however, 
when the unexpected appearance over the festive season of some old familiar faces led to unexpected results and to my triumph in two widely different cases. It began when I happened to mention the one Christmas institution that lit up my childhood and no early... No question. Youth. The great British pantomime. There's nothing to beat it. We were being entertained by the Erskine Browns in the open-plan kitchen with dining area of their up-to-the-minute Islington home. You go to the pantomime match, Rumpel? Ah, Claude, not since childhood. Claude Erskine Brown, QC. I always think those letters stand for queer customer. Claude is a fearless opera-goer and nervous advocate. When I was a boy, it was my annual treat. It made a profound impression on me. When you were a boy, the truth of the matter is that Rumpo's never quite grown up, and it's not only the pantomime. Pantomime? Is that a kind of mime show? Guys dressed as clowns, feeling imaginary walls, no one saying anything. No, 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 funnier than that. Robin Hood's mother was played by a red-nosed clown. A female comic? No, a male one. I don't know what sort of an idea of England you're giving the judge, Rob. Uh, we have clubs for that sort of thing in Pittsburgh. And a website, transvestites.com. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing sexual about it. The dame's a character who gets the audience singing. Singing? Yes, the, the words of the song come down on a sort of giant sheet, and, and she, who was really a he, gets the audience to sing along. And it's intensely embarrassing. Um, you oh. can oh. keep your salmon no. and lobster no. too, <laughs> feed oh. your mackerel to seals at the zoo Goodness. for breakfast and dinner. I've only oh. one wish, the glorious sight of my favourite oh. dish. All together, come on! No, no, no. Oh. Oh. Emboldened by the Erskine Brown's claret, smoother on the tongue and with more of a kick than my usual Chateau Thames embankment. I broke into a stanza of the song I was introduced to in my youth by Robin Hood's masculine mother. That'll be quite enough. Every time we're asked out to dinner, I beg him not to sing. Ah, golden memories. I'm afraid I got carried away. You know, Mr Rumpel, I think you were wrong. I do detect in that song you just sang some undercurrent of sexual innuendo. I have to admit, it, it passed me by. I see they're doing Aladdin at the Tufnell Park Empire. Do you think the twins might enjoy it, Rumpo? Oh. We took them to Bayreuth last year. The speaker I was really Mrs. Justice Erskine Brown. Mm. Phyllida Trant as she was in happier when days, when I first called her... The Porsche sure of our chambers. My cup of tea, she was still possessed of a beauty that would break the hearts of the toughest prosecutors and made old lags tremble with lust, even as she passed a stiff custodial sentence. I think the twins would adore the pantomime. The twins were Tristan and Isolde, so named by her opera-loving husband, Claude. Just the thing to cure the Wagnerian death wish and bring them into a world of sanity. Sanity? With old guys dressed up as mothers? I promise you they'll love every minute of it. I know I would. And I'll tell you what, Philadelphia. And then I made another promise that sounded rash, even as I spoke the words. I'll take them myself. Oh, thank you, Rumpo. No, it'll have to be after Christmas. My wife Hilda, known to me only as she who must be obeyed, briskly postponed the promise of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp. We're invited up to Norfolk for the holiday. Norfolk? Oh, God. As she said the word Norfolk, a cold, sleeping wind seemed to cut through the central heating of the Erskine Browns' Islington dining room, and I felt... A warning shiver. Oh, good God. The ritual of Christmas at home in Froxbury Mansions was to be rudely interrupted. The exchange of presents, the tie which I would seldom wear, the annual bottle of lavender water which Hilda lays down rather than puts to immediate use, would have to take place in this stranger's house. I had grown used to the Queen's speech at home when I lay bets with myself as to whether Hilda will stand yet again to attention when the telly plays the national anthem. 
the thawed-out bird from Safeways, followed by port, an, an annual gift from my faithful solicitor, Bonnie Bernard. And then pudding was to be abandoned for an unpredictable meal with people I'd never met. We sat in a sullen train which dawdled northwards. Why are we going to Norfolk exactly? I was at school with Poppy Longstaff. What's that got to do with it? How many times have I got to tell you, Rumpo? Hmm? How many times? I knew the answer to this question, of course. Hilda's old school has this in common with polar expeditions, natural disasters, and World War II. Those who have lived through it are bound together for life and can always call on each other for mutual assistance. Poppy's Eric is rector of Cold Sounds. And for some reason or other, he seems to want to meet you, Rompo. Meet me? Well, that's what she said. So does this mean I have to spend Christmas in the Arctic Circle and miss our festivities? It's not the Arctic Circle. It's Norfolk, Rumpo. Yes. And our festivities aren't all that festive. So try and be grateful to Poppy and her husband. And don't spend the whole of Christmas talking about old murders. Some people don't like that. Oh, God. My first impression of Cole Sands was of a gaunt church with a spire, presumably of great age, pointing an accusing finger to heaven from a cluster of houses on the edge of a sullen gunmetal sea. My second was one of intense cold. Soon as we got out of the taxi, we were slapped around the face by a wind which must have started in freezing Siberia and gained nothing in the way of warmth on its journey across the plains of Europe. At the rectory, we were greeted cheerfully by Poppy Longstaff. We meet at last, Horace. Hilda's told me so much about you. And Eric's so looking forward to meeting you. Can I take your overcoat? I, I thought I might keep it on, just for the moment. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Rumpo. Let Poppy hang it up for you. Yes. And the muffler? Hilda's friend had one of those round... Childishly pretty faces often seen on seriously large women. And she seemed to keep going on incessant cups of hot, sweet tea. Eric? And a number He's of He's in his study, just putting the last-minute touches to his sermon. Oh. Eric, can I offer you a cup of tea? She moved oh, like an enormous tent into the house... And we followed her. Eric is having terrible trouble with the church spot. I was thinking really? longingly of my overcoat. Frosty winds made considerable moan round the rectory, owing to the doors that stopped about an inch short of the stone floors, and the windows which never shut properly, causing the curtains to billow like the sails of a ship at sea. We are an ancient foundation granted by William Rufus to the monks The rector was a slender, wraith of a man, with a high aquiline nose, two flapping wings of grey hair on each side of his face, and a vague air of perpetual anxiety, broken now and then by high and unexpected laughter. He made cruciform gestures, as though remembering the rubric. Spectacles, testicles, wallet and watch and forgetting where these important articles were kept. The church of St Barnabas was originally Norman, of course, oh. and the Gothic spire didn't come till later. Oh, oh such an historic little building. Uh, I'm afraid Rumpole isn't a great frequenter of churches. No. It was from the top of our spire that watch was kept for the Armada, and sailors used it to steer by. That's In dense fog, they pointed their ships towards the sound of cold sands bells. Oh. Yes. <laughs> and now our dear old spire is in urgent need of repair. <laughs> it happens to all of us, doesn't it, Rumpole? Speak for yourself, yes. was what I didn't say. A hundred thousand pounds... A hundred 
thousand. That's what we need. And uh, what, what have you got? Uh, after the emergency jumble sale, 45 pounds. You can see we've got some way to go. <laughs> yes, you have indeed. Yes. A small sherry. Ah, yeah, rather, rather lovely, yes. Mm, ah, thank small. you. Mm. You particularly wanted to see Rumpel this Christmas, Eric. Did you want his advice on a legal matter? Not really. Just as well. <laughs> Yes, I can't remember why I wanted to see you this Christmas. I can't, for the life of me, remember. I mean, I don't believe you've got a hundred thousand smackers in your back pocket, have you, Rumpo? <laughs> <laughs> your lack of faith is entirely justified. I wasn't exactly enjoying Cold Sands Rectory, and I was a little miffed that the Reverend couldn't remember why he'd asked me there in the first place. We had hoped that Donald Cumpson would help us out. I mean, he wouldn't notice a hundred thousand. Oh, <laughs> yes, we had high hopes of Mr. Cumpton. Really? Is this Cumpton some sort of spy lover, then? He's got wonderful taste. He bought the old manor house, and he's done it up beautifully. And I have to tell you, Hilda, mm. of course, he's not a young man anymore, but he is what we used to call at school a dish to dream of. Oh. <laughs> as dishy as Mr. Flanner, who took us for extra arts. Far dishier than Mr. <laughs> Flanner. <laughs> I looked at she who must be obeyed and wondered if she'd ever call me a dish to dream of. I thought on the whole, probably not. Donald Compton is, you might say, the perfect English gentleman. And they don't come more perfect than that. English with some slight but extremely attractive accent. Mm. He spent some years in Canada making his millions. Mm. And, of course, he's been very generous. He gave us the cricket pavilion and a tennis court for the school. Mm. Mad about sport, you see, Hilda. And he looks enormously fit. Really? Rumpel takes absolutely no exercise. I've offered to buy him weights. I take exercise. Drawing stiff corks out of bottles of Pomeroy's Plonk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, Eric, the tide seems to have gone down in this glass of sherry. Uh, oh. <laughs> Donald Compton's got a charming young wife who is not in the least standoffish. Oh, no, neither is he. All that money and not a bit of side to him. Uh, but he wouldn't mm. chip in to save the spire. He might have done... But you know, Eric... Not very well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he does rather tend to put his foot in it. The Remembrance Day service. We held it outside by the war memorial. Donald Compton was there, of course, looking very distinguished. <laughs> Unfortunately, Eric asked us to pray for the enemy that fell in battle. And their families. And their families. Well, it seemed to me only fair. Oh, perhaps fair, darling, but hardly tactful. Mr. Compton walked away from the service. Still looking terrifically distinguished. <laughs> I've done hours of hard knee work, begging the Lord to soften Donald Compton's heart towards our spire. No results so far, I no. fear. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Mm. He'll be in church on Christmas Day, Hilda, and you'll see what I mean by dishy. I can't wait. And we're <laughs> all invited for drinks at the manor, so I haven't quite given up hope. Oh. He asks everyone, you know, and of course it is an enormous privilege. <laughs> Uh, Poppy made it sound as though the Pope, the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop of Canterbury would be leading the carols and that we'd been invited to drop in for high tea at Windsor Castle. In church, I prayed for a yule log blazing at the manor so that I could, in the true spirit of Christmas, thaw out gradually. church was beautiful, with a high timid roof and walls of weathered stone, 
peppered with marble tributes to the dead inhabitants of the manor. It was decorated with holly and mistletoe, a tree glowed, and there were candles over a crib. High heaven rejects the law of nicely calculated less or more. So deemed the man who fashioned for the sense these lofty pillars, spread that branching roof, self-poised and scooped into 10,000 cells, where light and shade repose, where music dwells lingering, and wandering on as loath to die. Like thoughts whose very sweetness yieldeth proof that they were born for immortality. Oh. So wrote Wordsworth, sublime poet and old sheep of the Lake District, who, although born without a single joke in him, oft comforts my solitary hours. He was describing quite another building, but his lines did rather well for Cold Sands Parish Church. I thought how many generations of Cold Sands inhabitants, their eyes bright and faces flushed with the wind, had belted out the hymns. I had found myself a place in church near to a huge, friendly, gently humming, occasionally belching radiator, and I was clinging to it and stroking it as though it were a new found mistress. And not that I have much experience of new or even old found mistresses. <laughs> when the carol was over, a man left the row in front of me and stepped up to the lectern. A man of middle height, with silvery hair, still handsome, and with a carefully preserved tan that must have been difficult to maintain under clouded Norfolk skies. He was dressed in a tweed suit, and as he unfolded a neat little pair of gold half-glasses and settled them on his nose, I was sure that he was Cold Sand's wealthiest citizen. The great Donald Compton would, of course, have been chosen to read the lesson. The young man saith to him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell all thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. I bet Donald Compton, millionaire lord of the manor, wished Jesus had never said any such thing. Now, as a sign of Christmas fellowship, will you all stand and shake hands with those in front and behind you? Eric, in full canonicals, standing on the steps of the altar, made the suggestion as though he'd just thought of the idea. And wish each other... A happy Christmas. I smelled a discreet masculine aftershave, and the lord of the manor had turned to face me. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. His soft brown eyes looked away from me almost at once. I felt a touch of his dry fingers, and then I was left, staring at his well-tailed back after the most perfunctory of greetings. Let us pray. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble or cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble... I have to confess I wasn't listening to the prayers. I was otherwise engaged. Wondering why it was that as the man in front of me touched my fingers and turned away... I felt that I had lived through that moment before, and many years ago. After the icy church, the manor house glowed with warmth and hospitality. There was, in fact, a huge log fire, crackling and throwing a dancing light on the marble floor of the circular entrance hall, with its great staircase leading up to private shadow. The cream of cold sands was being entertained to champagne and canapes by the new lord of the manor. The decibels rose as the champagne went down, 
and the little group began to sound like an army of tourists in the Sistine Chapel, noisy, excited and wonderstruck. Oh, they must all be his ancestors. She who must be obeyed was admiring the lines of portraits on the wall. Long-necked women gazing sadly over ruined temples, portly men decked with medals and sashes, with hungry-looking dogs licking their boots, old men in wigs looking cynical, as though they had seen it all and didn't believe a word of it. She had paused, an unaccustomed glass of champagne in her hand, before a scarlet-coated general on a prancing horse. Somewhere in the background, there was the smoke and carnage of a distant battlefield. Donald Compton comes from a long line of military leaders. You can tell that from the way he stands. My mouth was full of cream cheese enveloped in smoked salmon. I swallowed it to say, They can't be his family portraits. After all, he only moved in here a couple of years ago. Oh, but I expect he brought his family portraits here from somewhere else. Oh, you mean he had them under the bed in the apartment in Calgary? <laughs> Try and be serious, Rumpole. You're not nearly as funny as you think you are. Just look at the family resemblance. I'm absolutely certain that all of these are old cartons. Oh. Oh. And it was when she said that that I remembered everything perfectly clearly. In the varied ups and downs, the thrills and spills in the life of an old Bailey hack, one thing stands as a stone. Your ex-customers will never want to see you again. Even if you've steered them to the rocks of the prosecution case and brought them out of the calm waters of a not guilty verdict, they won't plan further meetings, host reunion dinners, or even send you a card on your birthday. If they catch a glimpse of you on the underground or across a crowded wine bar, they will bury their faces in their newspapers or look studiously in the opposite direction. This is understandable. Days in court represent a period of time they'd rather forget. As a rule, I'm not especially keen to renew an old acquaintance when a face I once saw in the old belly dock reappears at the scales of justice dinner. Reminiscences of the past are best avoided, and what is required is a quick look and a quiet turn away. But not, however, on this occasion. He was with his wife. She was wearing a black velvet dress and had long, fair hair that glittered in the firelight. They were talking to a bald, pink-faced man and his short and dumpy wife, and they were all laughing. Compton's laughter stopped as he saw me coming towards him. <laughs> Hello. Delightful party. I don't think we've met. Oh, yes, we have. We shook hands in the church this morning. My name's Rumpole, and I'm staying with the Longstaffs. Ah, uh, uh, this is my wife, Lorelei. Oh, and, to meet you. and Colonel and Maudie Jacobs. Lovely to meet you. <laughs> Happy Christmas. Yeah, what did you say your name was? Rumpole. Oh. Horace Rumpole. Staying with the Longstaffs, you know. Dear old Eric Longstaff. Saintly man, of course. Mm. Pity he blotted his copybook on Remembrance Day. Uh, praying for the enemy. <clears throat> Not the sort of thing you want to hear in church. I do hope you're enjoying the Christmas holiday, Rumpole. Well, it's not exactly a holiday. I'm here to do a job. What sort of job, exactly? Didn't Poppy tell us you're a lawyer? Oh, you down here on a case. What sort of case? And how exciting. Yeah. Well, not a case, exactly. I'm here to do a bit of fundraising. <laughs> Fundraising? Whatever for? Well, as a matter of fact, for the spire of the church we were in today. Oh. We've met before, haven't we, Mr. Compton? Long ago. Well, Donald meets so many people. You're a lawyer, Rumpole. I've got some books in the library, first-hand accounts oh. of famous cases. Do you think that might interest you? I think it might interest me very much. <laughs> uh, excuse us, darling, won't you? Yes, of course. More champagne. Or maybe a little mulled wine. Oh, my God. Two words from Hilda had done it. Old and Compton. I knew then what I should have remembered when we touched hands in the pews. That Old Compton is a street in Soho. And that was perhaps why Ricardo known as Dicko Peducci, had adopted the name. The Peducci territory had been in those days not rolling Norfolk acres, 
but a number of Soho strip clubs and clip joints. Oi, care for a drink, Come in for a drink and a chat, love. Good company, are you, my dear? Girls would stand in front of these clubs and beckon to the lonely, the desperate and the unwary. Often they would escape with no more damage than £20 for a watery cocktail. Unlucky, affluent and important customers might even get invited to a cheaply scented love nest, well supplied with concealed microphones and hidden cameras, to produce material which was used for systematic and highly profitable blackmail. The victim in Dicko's trial was an obscure and not much loved circuit judge. Because of that, the case was regarded as particularly serious by the prosecuting authority. Members of the jury, have you reached a verdict on which you're all agreed? We have, my lord. Do you find Ricardo Paducci guilty or not guilty of blackmail and keeping a bawdy house? Guilty, my lord. It was shortly before another long, distant Christmas that I rose to plead for a short sentence before his honour, Judge Bullingham, a task which would make turning base metal into gold look like a complete doddle. Have you anything to say in mitigation of these horrible offences, Mr Rumpel? I certainly have. I can't believe that even you would ask for mercy. I certainly can, my lord. First of all, there's very little evidence of Paducci playing an active part in keeping this club. This brothel, you mean? He was hardly ever seen there. In fact, he rarely seems to have visited Soho. There's very little evidence that he knew exactly what was going on in the bar exotic. He didn't go there because he was the big wheel. The boss man, the brains of the whole sordid organisation. His non-appearance is a sign of guilt. You mean you could go into a street and pick up a complete stranger and say he must be guilty because he never went there? I didn't say that. Then I misunderstood, Your Lordship. Is that your best point, Mr Rumpel? No, my best point is that we're near Christmas. What's Christmas got to do with it? Christmas, my lord, has everything to do with it. It brings us the message that mercy will be shown even to the sinner that our crimes and follies will be forgiven, that even the most misguided of us can hope for salvation. That, my lord, is the message of the story which began in a stable in Bethlehem. And that story ends, to the best of my recollection, with a pretty sharp sentence on a couple of thieves. I can't pass a sentence of death in this disgusting case, Mr. Rumpel, which may be a matter of some regret. Is that all you have to say? All, my lord. And at this time of Christmas, it should be enough. Very well. Yes? Will the defendant stand? Ricardo Paducci, you have besmirched the fair name of Old Compton Street, which used to be, if my memory serves me, a thoroughly respectable thoroughfare. You have also used the weaknesses of respectable citizens to extract money from them. You have even brought the law into disrepute. You and your like are the parasites that suck blood from the body politic. The least sentence I can in all decency pass upon you is one of seven years' imprisonment. Take him down. Look, I'm sorry. We were unlucky in our judge. (sighs) He didn't seem to like you much. With what you can get off for good behaviour, you could be out in no time. Ah, forget it. Forget me. I know you will. I look after myself now. I might surprise them. I might surprise you. Yes. Then I got the very same handshake, a slight touch, and a quick turn away that I had experienced in Cole Sands Church. Well, good luck, Dicko. Arriva Dirty. <laughs> I suppose it was going to happen sooner or later. Not necessarily. We were standing in the library, drinking whiskey, in front of a comforting fire and among leather-bound books, which I strongly suspected had been bought by the yard. The new, like the old dicker, was soft-eyed, quietly spoken, almost unnaturally calm the perfect man behind the scenes of a blackmailing operation or a country estate. 
You seem to have done pretty well for yourself. Solid citizens still misbehaving themselves round old Compton Street, are they? <clears throat> I wouldn't know. I gave all that up and went into the property business. Really? Where did you do that? Canada? <laughs> I never saw Canada. Garrick Prison. <laughs> Up-and-coming area in the home counties. The screws there were ready and willing to do the deals on the outside. I paid them embarrassingly small commissions. How long were you there? Four years. By the time I came out, I'd got my first million. Then I did you a good turn losing your case. A bit of luck is honour Judge Bullingham didn't believe in the remission of sins. You think I got what I deserved? Treat every man according to his deserts, I quoted Hamlet to him. And who shall escape whipping? Then I can trust you, Rumpole. I've worked hard. I've earned the respect of the community here. The Lord Chancellor is going to put me on the bench. The Lord Chancellor lives in a world of his own. You don't think I'd do well as a magistrate? Well, I suppose you'd speak from personal experience of law courts and have some respect for the quality of mercy. I've got no time for that, Rumpole. I believe in cracking down hard on crime. His voice became quieter but harder. The brown eyes lost their softness. That, I thought, was how he must have looked when one of his clip-joint girls was caught with a punter's cash stuffed in her tights. Well, now, can I trust you not to go out there and spread the word about the last time we met? And that depends. On what? How well you understand the Christmas message. Which is? Perhaps, um, generosity? Oh, I see. You want your bun. <laughs> oh, not me, Dicko. I've been paid inadequately by legal aid. But there's an impoverished church spire in urgent need of resuscitation. Ah, uh, that Eric Longstaff. He's not a patriot. And are you? I do a good deal of work locally for the British Legion. And I'm sure next poppy day they'll appreciate what you've done for the church spire. He looked at me for a long minute in silence. I thought that if this scene had been taking place in a back room in Soho, there might quite soon have been the flash of a knife. Instead, his hand went into an inside pocket and produced nothing more lethal than a checkbook. Um, while you're in a giving mood, the rectory is in desperate need of central heating. <laughs> Ricardo Peducci, now known as Donald Compton, looked at me, apparently deeply shocked. This is bloody blackmail. Very well, Dicko. You should know. Christmas Day was over. The year turned, stirred itself, and opened its eyes onto a bleak January. Crimes were committed, arrests were made, and the courtrooms were filled once again with the sound of argument. I went down to the Old Bailey on a trifling matter of fixing the date of a trial before Mrs Justice Erskine Brown. As I was leaving, the usher came and told me that the judge wanted to see me in her private room on a matter of urgency. Such summonses always fill me with apprehension and a vague feeling of guilt. What had I done? Got the date of a trial hopelessly muddled? Dressed the court with my trousers carelessly unzipped? I was relieved when the learned Philida greeted me warmly. My dear Rumpo, <laughs> how lovely to see you. <laughs> Sherry? And even offered me a glass of oh, sherry. Thanks, dear. Yeah. Poured from her own personal decanter. It was so kind of you to offer, Rumpole. Uh, offer what? Well, you told us how much you loved the traditional British pantomime. Yes, so I did. For a happy moment, I imagined her ladyship as principal boy, her shapely legs encased in black tights, her neat little wig slightly askew, slapping her thigh and calling out in bell-like tones, Cheer up, Rumpole. Portia's not far away. The twins are looking forward to it enormously. <laughs> uh, 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 lo looking forward to what? Aladdin at the Tufnell Park Empire. <gasps> uh, I've got the tickets for the 19th of Jan. 
You do remember promising to take them, don't you? Uh, what other promise might I have made after the fifth glass of the Erskine Brown Saint Emilion? Oh, I'd love to be one of the party. And will old Claude be buying us dinner afterwards? <laughs> I really don't think you should go around calling people old, Rumpole. Phillida now looked miffed, and I downed the sherry before she took it into her head to deprive me of it. Claude's got us tickets for Pavarotti, L'Elysieur d'Amore. You might buy the children a burger after the show. Oh, and it's not far from us on the tube to bring them home. It really was sweet of you to invite them. At which she smiled at me and refilled my glass in a way which made it clear she was not prepared to hear further argument. It all turned out better than I could have hoped. Tristan and Tisolda, unlike their Wagnerian namesakes, were cheerful, reasonably polite, and only seemed anxious to disassociate themselves as far as possible from the old fart who was escorting them. Uncle Horace? At every available opportunity, they would touch me for cash and then scamper off to buy ice cream, chocolates, sandwiches, and Sprite. At last, they were settled in the stalls, snacking contentedly, as the story of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp unfolded before our eyes. New lamps for old! A new lamps for old! Hello, children! <laughs> Isn't it a beautiful day? Oh, by the way, have you seen an old lamp cell around here? <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> New lamps for old. Oh, there you are, lamp seller. Look, I brought this old lamp we had in our kitchen at home. Ooh, what a beauty. Yes, and it's all mine. Aladdin was a personable young woman named in the programme as Millicent Greenway, who trained at RADA and played the popular barmaid in Liverpool Street, a long-running television series set in the railway station of that name. She had an upturned nose, coppery hair, memorable thighs, and a voice that could have been used to control crowds or low-flying aircraft. Bye-bye, boys and girls! See you later! Be good! Uncle Abenaza was also played by a star of television, famed for his role as caring social worker in the series Counselling. Regrettably, Wishy and Washy sang Delilah to the accompaniment of electric guitars. But Widow Twanky, acted by a certain Jim Diamond, was all a dame should be. A nimble little cockney fitted up with a sizable false bosom, thick makeup, a flaming red wig, sweeping eyelashes and scarlet lips. Never have I heard the immortal line, Where's that naughty boy Aladdin got to better deliver? <laughs> Naughty boy Aladdin got to. Out in the street! Huh? Oh, out in the street, is he? Hmm. He ought to be helping me with the laundry. Only help that boy ever gives me is to open the washing machine door. <laughs> oh. oh, what on earth is this? Is this next door's bra or a couple of pudding basins? <laughs> and this? A mountain climber's rope or Anne Widdicombe's G string? <laughs> Oh, dear. Oh, Mrs Gormley's white knickers. Make a nice tent, they would. Or she could run them up a flagpole as a sign of surrender. <laughs> she was stuffing absurd laundry into a vast washing-up machine, firing off the old jokes as though no-one had ever heard them before. <laughs> My husband, Mr Twanky, wasn't much help either. He's long gone, of course. Oh, my husband... He could bring happiness and laughter into our house simply by not coming home. <laughs> the next door, Mrs Gormley. Bit of a nosy parker, Mrs Gormley. She said to me, quite honestly, isn't your husband a bit of a pain in the neck? Quite honestly, Mrs Gormley, I told her. I've got a lower opinion of him than that. <laughs> Aladdin! Aladdin! Oh. Where's that naughty boy got to? Men. You know, they can get a man on the moon, can't they? 
Well, I don't know why they can't put them all up there. <laughs> I'll tell you something. I will tell you something. I hate housework. I hate it. You make the beds, do the dishes, and six months later, you've got to do them all over again. <laughs> oh, it's getting dark. Where's my old lamp? Aladdin's got it. Oh, where is that naughty boy, then? Ooh. Hello, boys and girls. Oh, what ugly audience. Uh, get out of it. <laughs> Uncle Ebenezer, you found my naughty boy. He was doing some sort of trade with a lamp seller. Trade? What sort of trade? I know you'll be pleased, Mother. I swapped our nasty old lamp for a beautiful new one. That thing? <laughs> you traded in our lovely old lamp for that thing? <laughs> anyway, it's all dusty. I thought you'd be so pleased. Aren't you going to let me kiss you, Mother? Certainly not. Get away from me. Keep your kisses to yourself. I never know where they've been. <laughs> not a very affectionate mother, this widow, thank you. She's not, is she, Uncle Horace? You do love me, don't you, Mother? Oh, dear. Oh, yes. You make me want to jump for joy. Off a cliff. <laughs> now, this lamp, my dear Twanky, might I suggest a quick rub with a duster? No! Get away with you. I don't do that sort of thing. Oh, the lamp. I meant if you give the lamp a quick polish. Oh, all right. There should be a duster down there. <laughs> oh, yes, there it is. In the bread bin. <laughs> That's it. See what it looks like with a bit of polishing. So she polished the lamp. <laughs> and gave the twins the surprise of their young lives. <laughs> <Whoa. Ooh. laughs> Who's he, Uncle Horace? The slave of the lamp. Wow. <laughs> I am the slave of the lamp. Oh, really? We weren't expecting you. I've been staying in for the plumber to come about the bull cock. It is my pleasure and privilege, oh, beauteous mistress of the blue horizon. It was so nicely spoken, isn't it? To grant you three wishes. What's he talking about? Go on, tell him what your heart desires. He's a genie, Mother. Mm, is that what he is? Go on, have a wish. Oh, all right, then. No, no, not you, her. There. I wish. I wish. Yes? You wish what? Oh, Queen of the Hidden Lakes. Oh, wish all this washing was done. Between washing, huge knickers, mammoth brass, red and white striped vests fell from above onto the stage. Oh, marvellous. And then... And your next wish, oh, most beauteous one. Shall I? Why not? You still have one left. I think I'd like a nice kipper for my breakfast. Oh! I could hardly believe it. It was a traditional pantomime in the best possible tradition. And down came the song sheet and now the words were... <laughs> just the same. <laughs> Perhaps the song had been dug out by some enthusiast from a pile of old pantomime numbers, gathering dust in a theatrical attic. Perhaps it had never died, but merely gone underground, like a revolutionary ditty to be sung in private by superannuated dames or elderly principal boys. And now oh, here we go. it emerged in its full on. glory. You keep your salmon and lobster too. Feed your mackerel to seals at the zoo. For breakfast and dinner, I've only one wish. The glorious sight of my favourite fish. Whoa! Since I was a nipper, I've always loved a kipper. What's a kipper, and Uncle Horace? Gorgeous thing, smoked herring, full of bone. Butter it well and have it for breakfast. Dad has muesli for breakfast. Mama's hot water and lemon. Now they're going to ask us to sing. Let's hear it for all those up on the shelves. Since I was a snipper. You wait, our turn will come. And so has my loving wife. It's all very quiet up there, hasn't it? Yeah, oh dear. Let's try the lot in the bargain basement. Let's hope they've got a bit more snap in their celery. Come on then. All of you down below. Since I was a nipper, I've always loved a kipper. And so has my loving wife. Come on, kids, sing up. If you know a girl, just slip her. 
and nice and fresh and kipper, and she'll be yours for life. <laughs> It was, in fact, and in fairness, all a traditional pantomime should be. And yet I had a vague feeling that something was wrong, an element was missing. But as the cast came down a white staircase in glittering costumes to enthusiastic applause, it seemed the sort of pantomime I had grown up with, and which Tristan and Isolde should be content to inherit. After so much excitement, I felt in need of a stiff brandy and soda. But the eatery the children had selected for their evening entertainment had apparently gone teetotal, and alcohol was not on the menu. Uncle Horace. Oh, thank you ever so much, Uncle Horace. Ah, oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. Look, I'm uh, just popping out uh, back in the tent. Once they were confronted by their mammoth burgers and fries, I made my excuses said I'd be back in a moment, and slipped into the nearby pub, which was, I noticed, opposite the stage door of the Empire. As the life-giving draught was being poured, I found myself standing next to Washi and Uncle Abnaza, now out of costume, who were discussing Jim the day. Jim's a bit unfriendly tonight. Locks himself in his dressing room before the show and won't come in here for a drink afterwards. <laughs> I reckon he's upset about something. <sighs> Can't be a star billing. He's way up there with Millicent from Liverpool Street. <laughs> Maybe he's had a bust up with Molly. Uh, unlikely. Jim and Molly never had a crossword. Mm. Of course, there are things she doesn't know about. Uh, could I have a reefer, please? Alcohol levels sunk to a dangerous level. <laughs> you mean she may have found out that Jim's been polishing Aladdin's wonderful lamp? <laughs> no, I don't reckon she knows that. If she did, we'd have heard about it. Yeah, I suppose so. Oh, Jim was in great form tonight, though, wasn't he? He was never better. There was one funny thing, though. Oh, yeah? You know those artificial knockers Jim wears? Yeah. Strapped on polystyrene, hard <laughs> as bloody iron. <laughs> Bruises me when I dance with him. Not much fun there, dancing with Jim. Well, not usually. But tonight... It was all quite soft. Got a new costume, had he? Oh. Yeah, perhaps he borrowed them from a blow-up doll. <laughs> <laughs> they were both laughing as I gulped my brandy and legged it back to the hamburgers. In the dark passage outside the stage door, I saw a small, nimble figure in hurried retreat. Jim Diamond, I thought, who for some reason hadn't wanted to join the boys at the bar. After I had restored the children to the Erskine Brown's au pair, I sat in the tube on my way back to Gloucester Road and read the programme. Jim Diamond, it seemed, had started his life in industry before taking up show business. He had a busy career in clubs and turned down appearances on television. I only enjoy live shows, Jim says. I want to have the audience where I can see him. His photograph, without the exaggerated female makeup, showed a pale, thin nosed, disagreeable little man, with a lip curled either in scorn or triumph. Stripped of his makeup, there was something about this comics and smiling face which brought back memories of another meeting in totally different circumstances. It was the second time within a few weeks that I had found an old, familiar face cast in a new and unexpected part. The idea, the memory I couldn't quite grasp, preyed on my mind until I was tucked up in bed. Hilda was already asleep. Her latest historical romance had dropped from her weary fingers. She had turned her back on me, and I saw the face in the programme again quite clearly, but in a different setting. Not Diamond, not Sparker, but Spark's man. A logical progression. Got it. Is that you, Rumble? I don't know who else it could possibly be. You know, the extraordinary thing about that pantomime... Oh, tell me tomorrow. The Widow Twanky was played by Jim Sparksman. A one-time safe-breaker who took to acting in one of Her Majesty's prisons. Typical of you, Rumpel. You can't even go to the pantomime without meeting some criminal or other. Good night. Oh, 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 good night. 
what a thing. <laughs> oh, since I was a nipper, I've always loved a kipper, and so has my love. No singing, Rumpo. Yes, dear. Dennis, are you talking about Dennis, Mr. Rumpole? Oh, God. The boy couldn't have done it, Mr. Rumpole. Well, do you really think so, Frank? Nah, not a complicated, bloody great job to that extent. His only way of getting at a safe was to dig it out of the wall and remove it bodily. <laughs> He'd done that in a bark inside boutique job. And what was inside it hardly covered the cost of the petrol. <laughs> yeah. I was back at work. The days of kipper songs and magic lamps, of genies and church spires had passed. I was in my room in chambers, in discussion with one of my most regular customers, a member of the family of South London villains known as the Timpsons, who confined themselves to ordinary, decent crime, such as middle-of-the-road shoplifting, and disapproved as strongly as anyone of drug dealing, incest, and the carrying of shooters. My young nephew, Dennis, quite honestly, Mr. Rumpel, he's never going to be brain of Britain. He could never have done that Croydon Savings Bank job. That called for special skills, Mr. Rumpel. And quite honestly, again, there's no one in our family today that could reach them dizzy heights. Really? <laughs> uh, the speaker was Fred Timpson, clear headed and sensible. And now, after the retirement of his elder brother to a small but comfortable villa on the sunnier side of Mabea, head of the family... Uh, so far as your nephew's concerned, Fred, there is the evidence of young Charlie Malloy. Oh, Peanuts Malloy? Well, we've heard from him before, haven't we, Mr Rumbo? Indeed we had. He had figured in a number of Timpson cases, and we knew absolutely nothing to his credit. Hmm... Peanuts, indeed. He says he was one of the lookout men. He also says that your Dennis was in charge. Oh, yeah, in charge. Our Dennis couldn't be in charge of a group of girl guys playing hopscotch. <laughs> He's barely in charge of himself, Mr Rumbo. Yeah, I think you're right, there, yeah. <laughs> well, he goes on to say that Dennis disconnected the burglar alarm, burnt his way into the safe and got his hands on 50,000 in cash. Oh, dirty little grass, that peanuts. Undoubtedly, but that's what he says. And does he go on to say that our Dennis jumped over a 20-foot wall, walked on his hands down Croydon High Street and took off in our air balloon? No, Fred, he doesn't say that. Oh, peanuts, he's a Malloy, Mr Rumbo. And do you know what? The Timpsons and the Malloys... He's chalk and cheese. That's yeah, very, yeah. very true. It was worse than that. The clan Malloy, who had no inhibitions about dealing in hallucinatory substances or going to work tooled up with flick knives and shooters, waged a perpetual turf war against Fred's family. If Peanuts felt like grassing, his victim would surely be a Timson. I'm going to see your young Dennis in Brixton. We'll find out what he says. Oh, good luck, sir. I'm afraid you won't find that he's got a lot to offer, not by way of conversation. We'll do our best. And you can't believe what he says. Not even if he tells you he'd done it. <laughs> to give myself a breather from the Timpson case, I went and stood outside my chambers in Equity Court, wearing my hat to protect the thinning top of my head from the drizzle, and thinking, as my old darling Wordsworth would say, of old... Unhappy, far off things and crimes so long ago. Around me in the doorways, under the arches or leaning against a sheltered wall, were many poor souls like me, driven out of doors. Most of them were girls. Short skirted, high heeled, with cigarettes dangling from their lips, they would seem to any passer by to be ladies of the night and the same casual observer might have been forgiven for supposing that the outer temple, home of the legal profession, had become a red-light district in the manner of downtown Amsterdam. The casual observer would have been wrong. Neither they nor I were out of doors to offer sexual services. We were temporary exiles from chambers which had become smoke-free zones. Claude Erskine Brown blamed my cheroots for the fact that his aunt had been flooded out by a climate change in Surrey. In vain I argued for the democratic right of minorities. 
the smoking ban was introduced by a tyrannical majority, so I had to bask in the warmth of a small cigar as the rain settled in the brim of my hat. Just try and remember, Claude had exhorted me. Smoke causes global warming even out of doors. Didn't you see the pictures of Godalming in full flood? I replied that I didn't go about searching for pictures of Godalming. My aunt, and here Claude's voice, rose to the doom-laden level of a newsreader, announcing the end of the world, had to be taken shopping in a collapsible canoe. Oh, tempora, O oh mores. My faithful solicitor, Mr. Bonnie Bernard, and I made a courtesy call on young Dennis Timpson in the Brixton prison interview room. We did our best to make him feel at home. So, how are you feeling, Dennis? I'm all right. Care for a cigarette, Dennis? I'm all right. You must be worried about these serious charges. I'm all right. Fred's nephew was a puzzled 23-year-old with a shaven head, a right earring, and a poor attempt at a moustache. He sat staring out of the window at the yard with its sunken flower beds and screws parading with their dogs. Only one thing stirred him into some sort of eloquence. Your Uncle Fred says you couldn't have done anything nearly as big and complicated as the Croydon job. <laughs> Who does he think he is? Uncle Fred bloody Timpson. Hardly a cray, is he? Hardly a great train robber. What's he got on his bloody record, eh? Nicking a van load of frozen pizzas. That's about the most Uncle Fred Timpson's got to boast about. Calls himself head of the family. Everybody's wrinkly old grandpa. How does that old fart know what I'm capable of? I'll tell you to your face, Mr Rumpo. <clears throat> I'm capable of a lot. What are you trying to tell us, Dennis? My instructing solicitor, Mr. Bernard, asked the relevant question. Are you trying to tell us you blew the safe in the Croydon Savings Bank? No, no I'm, not, I'm not telling you that, one way or the other. What are you telling us, then? I'm telling you that I've got the capacity. That's what I'm telling you. Just how many safes has Uncle Fred blown in his entire existence? Dennis was apparently incapable of answering a simple question. He'd have made a perfect politician. Oh, we're going now, Dennis. You'd better make up your mind whether you did it or not. Out of the shades of the prison house, Bonnie Bernard took a gloomy view of the situation. Hopeless. We've got ourselves a client who wants to boast about a crime he didn't do. Or did he? My mind was on another aspect of the case. The 19th of January... Yeah, that was the date of the Croydon Savings Bank job. Yes. It also happens to be the night I saw Aladdin at the Tufnell Park Empire. <laughs> what on earth's that got to do with it? I don't know. It might just be worth our while to find out. Dennis Timpson's case was to come up for committal at the magistrate's court before Skimpy Simpson, whose lack of success at the bar had driven him to a job as a stipendiary beak. His nickname had been earned by the fact that he had never, within living memory, been known to lash out on a round of drinks in Pomeroy's wine bar. In the usual course of events, th there's no future in fighting proceedings which are only there to commit the customer to trial. I had resolved to attend, however, to pour a little well-deserved contempt on the evidence of Peanuts Malloy. There was also the possibility that Bernard might provide me with a valuable witness. But the situation was by no means clear when I rose to cross-examine the officer in charge of the case. Ah, uh, Detective Inspector Grimble. Um, would you agree that whoever blew the safe in the Croydon Savings Bank did an extraordinarily skillful job? Mr Lumpo, are we meant to congratulate your client on his professional skills? Exactly the opposite, sir. I decided to ignore Skimpy and concentrate on a friendly chat with Detective Inspector Grimble, a large, comfortable gingerhead officer. We had lived together over many years with the Clan Timpson, 
and their misdoings. Uh, you'd agree, then, these thieves were well informed. They knew there would be a week's money in the safe. They knew that, yes. And was there a complex burglar alarm system that couldn't be put out of action simply by cutting the wires? Cutting the wires? Would have set it off. Ah, so putting the burglar alarm out of action would have required special skill. It would have done. Putting it out of action also stopped a clock in the office, so we know that occurred at 8.45. We know that, yes. And at 9.20, young Malloy was caught as he fell running to a getaway car. That is so. So this heavy safe was burnt open in little over half an hour. I fail to see the relevance of that, Mr. Rumpo. Skimpy was getting restless. Don't worry, sir. I'm sure the officer does. <laughs> Uh, uh, now, uh, that shows a very high degree of technical skill, doesn't it, uh, Detective Inspector? Oh, well, yes, of course, I'd agree with that. Exercised by a highly experienced Peter Mann. Uh, who is this Mr. Peter Mann? We, we haven't heard of him before. I marvelled at the ignorance of the basic facts of life displayed by the magistrate. Um, a man expert at blowing safe, sir. Known to the trade as a Peter man. Oh, ah, yes, yes, of course, of course. Um, so, uh, we had agreed, Inspector, that this was a highly expert piece of work. It must have been done by someone who knew his job pretty well, yes. Mm. Uh, Dennis Timpson's record shows uh, convictions for uh, uh, shoplifting, bag snatching, and stealing a radio from an unlocked car. In all of these simple enterprises, he managed to get caught. Your client's criminal record. You're allowing that to go into evidence, are you, Mr Rumpo? Certainly, sir, because there's absolutely no indication that he was capable of blowing a safe in record time or silencing a complicated burglar alarm. Am I right, Detective Inspector? You are, Mr Rumpo. There's nothing to show anything like that in his record. Would you agree, then, that in the profession of thieving, young Dennis Timpson is an incompetent amateur? Well, uh, hang on a minute. What's he calling me? Incompetent amateur? What's that mean? Dickhead? I've got to sit here listening to me being called a dickhead. Mr Rumpole, cannot you control your client? Uh, it's very difficult, sir. Might I step into the dock and give him legal advice? It might be as well. The legal advice I gave Dennis Timpson came in a whisper, which apparently echoed round the court. Shut up, you little twerp, or I'll go home and leave you to it. Understand? Oh, don't do that. The consultation over, I continued my agreeable dialogue with Detective Inspector Grimble. Uh, is it a fact that the number of expert Petermen is strictly limited? I believe that is so. And they are, by and large, known to the police? We have our sources of information, yes. Uh, Mr Rampo, where is all this leading? Uh, back a good many years, sir, to the home sweet home building society job at Cash Shorten, when Jim Sparksman blew a safe so quietly that even the dog slept through it. You were on that case, weren't you, Mr Rumpo? Sparksman got five years. And not one of your great successes. Uh, perhaps you wasted the court's time with unnecessary questions. Have you anything else to ask this officer? Uh, just uh, one thing. Uh, Inspector, doesn't this crime bear all the hallmarks of an expert safe blower? Like, for instance... Jim Sparksman, now known as Jim Diamond, who now has a new career on the stage. I must admit, Mr Rumpel, my thoughts did turn in that direction. Mm, yeah, that's very helpful. So have you checked Jim Diamond's movements on the evening of the 19th of January? Where was he at 8 o'clock? If you really want to know, Mr Rumpel... I certainly do. He was performing in the Christmas pantomime Aladdin at the Tufnell Park Empire. I'm afraid he has a cast-iron alibi. So, that's that, Mr Rumpole. Now, could we get on with dealing with the facts of this case? No, we couldn't. And that was because, as I looked desperately round the court, I saw no sign of my faithful solicitor, Bonnie Bernard, nor of the witness he had promised to deliver to me. Mr Rumpole... 
No doubt you will reserve your evidence until the trial at the Old Bailey. Uh, no, sir, I have a witness to call before you. Oh, very well. Call your witness. If only I could. It was half past three, and the clerk of the court had told me Skimpy had to leave at four to catch his usual train home to Haywood's Heath. So I claimed the right to make an opening speech for the defence, something unknown in a magistrate's court. Uh, sitting as a magistrate, you, sir, are not a rubber stamp. <laughs> you are not a mere pillar box. Put here to send cases onto the Central Criminal Court, you can... It's your duty to consider the prosecution on its merits. And should you decide it has no merits whatever, throw it out. I witted on about safe-breaking in general and the use of um, blowtorches. I touched on the, the great the institution of savings banks. The I discussed the geography of Croydon. I praised the honesty and acumen of Detective Inspector Grimble and touched on the history of committal proceedings. I was about to be driven back on the weather when Skimpy looked wearily at the clock and stopped me with a high-pitched bark. Have your witness here first thing tomorrow, Rumpole, or I come to an immediate decision. So Skimpy head off to Victoria Station. And in the morning... Silence in court. I called Mrs Diamond. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Are you Molly Diamond? I am. And are you married to Jim Diamond, as he is now known? I am. You can call it a marriage. When you married him, wasn't he Jim Sparksman? That was his proper name. And under that name, did he serve a long term of imprisonment? Yes. Yeah. I stood by him during all that time. And what was he in prison for? Blowing the safe on the Home Sweet Home Building Society in Carshalton. Was blowing safes his trade or profession when you first met him? That was what he did most of, yes. Mrs Diamond smiled, I thought, with a certain modest pride. But Skimpy didn't seem entirely happy with the evidence I was calling. Mr Rumpel. We are investigating your client's involvement in a raid on a savings bank in Croydon. What on earth has this man Diamond, or Sparksman, or whatever he's called, got to do with this case, I wonder? I looked round the court and saw Detective Inspector Grimble murmuring to the solicitor from the Crown Prosecution Service. I had warned Grimble that my witness might solve the savings bank mystery, and I expected him to help me to drag the truth out like a bad tooth from the jaws of the impatient skimpy. Uh, you say you wonder, sir. Mm. Then wonder on till truth makes all things plain. All will be revealed. Uh, Mr Kemp, don't you object to this evidence? Skimpy sought help from the prosecutor. A young man who'd listened to Grimble's advice. Uh, yeah, no, sir. The prosecution has no objection. Oh, very well, Mr. Rumpel, but keep it short. Um, uh, coming to the evening of the 19th of January, uh, was your husband playing Widow Twanky in the pantomime? Not that night, no. Oh, no sir. At the Tufnell Park Empire... I was in the audience. Mr. Rumpole, stop giving evidence. Then let me suggest that someone was playing with a twanky on the night.
of the Croydon Savings Bank raid. That was me. <gasps> Goodness me. But perhaps you could tell us how that came about. I'd done bits and pieces. Variety shows, summer season, stuff like that. Before I met Jim. While he was away, of course, I did a bit more of it. Just to keep things going. Well, I, I took an interest in his work, too. I, I watched rehearsals. I knew Twanky backwards. And Mr Kemp, are you still not objecting? Uh, no, sir. You were saying, Mrs Diamond, before we were interrupted. So when Jim asked me to stand in for him... What did you do? Well, I did what he wanted. I was looking at the woman in the witness box. Quiet, nervous, overawed by the proceedings. And suddenly I saw her again. Her lips scarlet, her face caked with makeup, crowned with a tousled red wig, as she dashed on with her arms full of washing Aladdin! and yelled at the children. Aladdin! Oh, where's that naughty boy got to? And then the glorious vision faded, and we were back in the South London Magistrates Court. Did he tell you why he wanted you to play Twanky? He said, like, it was a deadly secret. But he had to do a job he didn't want anyone to know about. It was something he had to do round Croydon way. You were to give him an alibi? Well, that's what I thought it was. I thought I loved him then. Not now. Not now I don't. That little tart, that Millicent. She can no more play Aladdin than I could play football for England. He only moved in with her. That's all he did. Moved into a stinking little tart's flat in Wimbledon Common, if you can believe it. Well, that did it. That put the old tin lid on it. I'm not helping him after that. He's yours now. You can do what you like with him. It was the voice, strident, outrageous, ultimately alarming of the widow Twanky. And as it died away, the young man from the Crown Prosecution Service got rather shakily, I thought, to his feet. Um, it might this case be adjourned, sir, so that we can make further inquiries? Detective Inspector Grimble arrested Jim Sparksman, also known as Diamond, for the Croydon job, and the case against Dennis Timpson was dropped. Deeply preoccupied by the fresh challenge of a new case, my breakfast next morning was rudely interrupted by she who must be obeyed. <sighs> I heard a heavy sigh on the other side of the toast and marmalade. Hilda's face was a study of sadness and regret as she looked down at the letter in her hand. I can't possibly go. It would be too embarrassing. You can't go where, Hilda? The old St. Elfrida's dinner. But you always go. Not now. It was a reunion Hilda never missed. A party at which her innumerable old school friends relived their gym slip years and which I welcomed as an opportunity for a quietly convivial evening in Pomeroy's wine bar with Bonnie Bernard. Look at this. She handed me the embossed invitation as though it were the announcement of a death. The president of the OEs this year is Lady Shiplake. Chrissy Snelling, as was. It's so not fair. She never came to OE reunions. But now she's married this Labour lord, they've made her president. Neither Dodo Macintosh nor I will be able to go now. Why ever not? <sighs> there was a long and solemn pause. And then Hilda uttered a word which I didn't know existed in her vocabulary. Guilt. You mean this Chrissy has a criminal record? No, we do. Dodo and I. Hilda! The breath had been knocked out of me. You're confessing to something. Dodo and I did it together. You were fellow conspirators? In what crime? We called her Smelling, of course. Here comes Chrissy Smelling. And we held our noses. We told her there was a rule that everyone had to run round the hockey field three times before breakfast. And Chrissy did it. Oh, we sent her fake Valentine oh. cards, making dates with non existent chaps from the boys' school. Oh, we pinched her knicker linings oh. and punctured her hot water bottle. Oh, disgusting. Uh, then, halfway through one term, a, a car with a chauffeur came and took Chrissy away. It was all our fault, Rumpole. Any other offences to be taken into consideration? I hope I looked suitably shocked. I can't think of any more at the moment. It's a formidable charge sheet. I know. 
And now Dodo and I simply couldn't face her again. Neither of us could. That's exactly why you got to go. For once in my married life, I was occupying the moral high ground, where the air was fresh and exciting. Oh, Rumpole! Could it be that she who must be obeyed was capable of a cry for help? Don't make me. Could I make her? Could I turn Judge Bullingham into a soft-hearted, do-gooding member of the Howard League for Penal Reform? <laughs> of course I couldn't. All the same, I meant to put up a fight for my evening with Bonnie Bernard in Pomeroy's. I just think... And here I gave Hilda the rumpo look of gentle but serious concern. That you have the honour of St. Alfreda's to consider. Dodo and I have always been intensely loyal to the old school. Always in the past, perhaps, but not now. Or is it part of the St. Elfrida's tradition to run away from your responsibilities? What do you want me to do, Rumpole? Ah, another record broken. Such a question had never been asked before in the long, windy history of our married life. Face up to it, Hilda. Confess everything and throw yourself at the mercy of the court. I am convinced... And now Rumpel was at his most judicial. ...that you and Dodo McIntosh will feel the better, the purer for it. For a long moment, the fate of my evening at Pomeroy's hung in the balance. Then she said... I'll ring Dodo and ask her what she thinks. You won't. You'll tell her what you think. I said, but not out loud. By now, I was satisfied that ringing Dodo would end in agreement that they should face the music. And so, a week or two later, Bonnie Bernard and I were able to enjoy an evening unfettered by domestic commitments in Pomeroy's wine bar. Over our second bottle of Chateau Thames Embankment, we discussed the recent Timpson case, and my solicitor was able to tell me exactly how he'd managed to trace Molly to her brother's house in Birmingham. She'd fled there when Jim Diamond, the notorious Peter Man, had finally left her. She couldn't wait to tell me her story. <laughs> that poor bloody Jim. She hated him. <laughs> but there's something I, I don't understand, Rumble. What's that? Well, uh, what put you onto her? Well, it was the strange failure of Jim to join the other actors for a drink after the show and what I heard in the pub. They said Jim had been polishing Aladdin's wonderful lamp. <laughs> yeah. well, uh, was that all? Oh. And Abenazer said he felt an unexpected softness <laughs> when he danced with Widow Twanky. Oh. But even before that, while I was watching the pantomime, I knew that something was wrong. Mm. Bonnie, it has taken some time for me to realise what I actually witnessed that night at the Tufnell Park Empire. Oh, and uh, what was that, Rumpole? It was nothing less than an outrage to a great British tradition. Widow Twanky being played by a woman. Dear, dear. Yes. I arose next morning, I confess, a little tardily, to be greeted by a cooked breakfast and the surprisingly cheerful countenance of she who must be obeyed. I ventured a question. Oh, by the way, how was the old girl's reunion? It went extremely well. In fact, it was a whole lot of fun. Dodo and I enjoyed it hugely. Hmm. I tried to imagine what sort of fun the old St. Elfrida's girls got up to. Failed and said, But I thought you were dreading it. Oh, we were. How was Chrissy? What's her name? You mean Chrissy Snelling? Uh, Lady Shipling mm. now. Oh, she was in the chair. And cut you two dead, did she? Not at all. She was enormously pleased to see us. She kept saying what an entertaining pair we were at school. She said we were a laugh a minute. She said that. I tried to picture she who must be obeyed and her friend Dodo McIntosh as two capering schoolgirls, constantly telling jokes and irritating the science mistress, but failed again. But you said that she left because of you and Dodo. Oh, she explained that. It was nothing to do with us. It wasn't? No, 
Chris's father. Schnelling. <laughs> oh, yes, anyway. He was high up in the Foreign Office and he got posted to Washington. So they decided to send her to school over there. It was quite a sudden decision. And no one told you that? No one. So you felt guilty all these years? <laughs> up till last night, yes. As I said to Dodo, it's quite a weight off my mind. It must be. Then I rose from the table and began to stuff my papers into my battered briefcase. I placed my pen in my top pocket and submerged my dirty plate and cutlery in the washing-up bowl, in accordance with the law formulated by she who must be obeyed. Rumpole? The voice of authority was particularly sharp that morning. Have you the remotest idea what you have just done? The remote idea, Hilda? I have prepared for work. I am going out into the harsh, unsympathetic world of a crown court for the sole purpose of keeping this leaky old mansion flat afloat <laughs> and well stocked with fairy liquid and such like luxuries. Is this the way you usually prepare for work? Yes, by consuming a light cooked breakfast and doing a bit of last minute housework. How else? And I suppose you intend to appear in court with the butter knife sticking out of your top pocket, having thrown your fountain pen into the sink. Oh, good God. A glance at my top pocket told me that she who must be obeyed, forever eagle-eyed, had sized up the situation pretty accurately. Well, a moment of confusion, I agree. My mind was on more serious matters. The absolution of my dear wife's guilt. Oh. Time passed. Spring came to the temple gardens. The crocuses were out. They were fresh green leaves and white blossom. When one morning Hilda opened a letter from Norfolk... She read it out to me. The repointing is going well on the spire, and we hope to have it finished by Easter. And I have to tell you, Hilda, the oil-fired heating has changed our lives. <laughs> Eric says it's like living in the tropics. Cooking supper last night, I had to peel off my Shetland woolly and my hand-knitted alpaca cardigan. <gasps> oh, dear Poppy. She who must be obeyed put down the letter from her old school friend, Poppy Longstaff. Noblesse oblige. What was that, Hilda? I could tell at once that Donald Compton was a true gentleman, the sort that does good by stealth. Of course, poor old Eric thought he'd never get the tower mended, but I somehow felt that Donald wouldn't fail him. It was noblesse. Perhaps it was, but in this case, the noblesse was Horace Rumpole's. Rumpole? What on earth do you mean? You hardly paid to have the church spy repointed, did you? In one sense, yes. I can't believe that. After all the years it took you to have the bathroom decorated, what on earth do you mean about your noblesse? Oh, it'd take too long to explain. But that which I am, I am. We are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven. That which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And not to yield? I'm not quite sure about that. Easter came, the work on the spire was successfully completed, and I was walking back to chambers after a gruelling day down the bailey when I saw, wafting through the temple cloisters, the unlikely apparition of the Reverend Eric Longstaff. He chirruped a greeting. My dear Rumpo, <laughs> terribly good to see you. <laughs> Do you know I'm so profoundly grateful that I decided to invite you down to the rectory last Christmas? You decided? Of course I did. I thought your wife Poppy extended the invitation to she who must be obeyed. Ah, dear Hilda, yes, but I thought of the idea. It was the result of a good deal of hard knee work and guidance from above. 
I knew you were the right man for the job. What job? The Compton job. What was this? The rector was speaking like an old con. The Compton job. What can you mean? I just mean that I knew you defended Donald Compton in his previous existence. How on earth did you know that? Eric drew himself up to his full willowy height and spoke proudly. I'm not a prison visitor for nothing. So I thought you were just the chap to put the fear of God into him. You were the very person to put the squeeze on the Lord of the Manor. Words were beginning to fail me. Put the squeeze on him? That was the idea. It came to me as a result of hard, hard knee work. So you brought us down to that freezing rectory just so I could blackmail the local benefactor. Didn't it turn out well? May the Lord forgive you. He is very forgiving. I spoke to the man of God severely. Well, the next time the church can do its blackmailing for itself. It was then that the rector smiled at me in a lofty manner. Oh, we're quite used to that. Particularly around Christmas. In Rumpole and the Old Familiar Faces, Rumpole was played by Desmond Barrett. Hilda, she who must be obeyed, Joanna David. The Reverend Eric Longstaff, Oliver Ford Davis, and Donald Compton, Tim McInerney. Fred Timpson was played by Nigel Anthony. Philida Erskine Brown, Patience Tomlinson, Judge Bullingham, Philip Voss, Skimpy Simpson, Johan Meredith, and Bonnie Bernard, Bruce Alexander. Detective Inspector Grimble was played by John Hartley. Aladdin, Rebecca Lacey, Dennis Timpson, Tom George, Widow Twanky, Tilly Vosborough, Tristan Lewis Reese, and his solder, Lauren Bird. The pantomime music was written and played by Neil Brown. Rumpole and the Old Familiar Faces was written by John Mortimer, directed by Marilyn Imrie, and is a Catherine Bailey production for BBC Radio 4. Rumpole and the Reign of Terror by John Mortimer Part 1. Truth Makes All Things Plain Well, here I am at last, safe and sound in the box room. It's a bit untidy, but a perfect hiding place. And I've done it at last. Gone and bought a word processor. It was at a reasonable price, on offer at Dachshunds, where a really helpful salesperson assured me that it was an excellent buy and it would do all my spelling for me. I told him that wouldn't be necessary, as I was always in the A's for spelling at school. So... The... Memoirs... Of... Hill... Da Rumpo. This is where it starts. It all started one afternoon when I was in number nine court at the Old Bailey, not a particularly distinguished address, where I was conducting the fairly hopeless defence of one of the Timpson family that famous clan of South London villains whose output of ordinary decent crime keeps the Rumpole family in dinners and such luxuries as lavatory cleaner, washing-up liquid and furniture polish. Members of the jury, Percy Timpson was not at work on the window of number 7 Laxton Crescent in order to obtain illegal entry by night for the purpose of theft. He was merely walking down Laxton Crescent and seeing a window unsecured and open, he was endeavouring to shut it in order to protect the householder. As you know, 
It is for the prosecution to prove its case. If you have the slightest doubt, members of the jury, it will be your duty, and no doubt your pleasure, to return a ringing verdict of not guilty. I sat down then, and his honor, Judge Bullingham, known to me as the Mad Bull, proceeded to put the boot in. Members of the jury, it may come as a relief to you to emerge from the world of fantasy and make-believe into which Mr. Rumpole has led you to confront the reality of this case. Can you really believe that this man, Mr. Percy Timpson, was merely helping the owner of a strange house to shut his windows in the night? <laughs> if you believe that, you'll believe anything. The mad bull did his worst. I glanced up at the public gallery. From the very front row, just above the clock, a young woman was smiling down at me, as though I was, for her at least, an object of extraordinary interest. I think that Mr. Rumpole's marvellous. I really do. As he leant over the rails of the dock at the start of the lunchtime adjournment, Percy Timpson identified my apparent fan in the public gallery. That's Tiffany. My cousin Raymond's youngest. We don't see much of Ray nowadays. She worked at an hospital, married a Pakistani doctor. Oh. Yeah, I reckon she considers herself a cut above us now. What's she come here for? Just to gloat and my bit of bad luck? When we left the court at the end of the day, the young woman whom he had called Tiffany came up to me and my solicitor, Bonnie Bernard. Gloating seemed to be the last thing she had in mind. My whole family's always talking about you, Mr. Rumpole. The way you stand up to the judges. Oh. <laughs> I came to see you in action. I must say, I wasn't disappointed. I know you can help us. Are you in trouble? Not me. It's my husband. Oh, your husband, the doctor. You know that? Yes, I do. They've taken him away. They won't tell me where. They won't tell me anything. I think it's some sort of prison. Well, what for? Well... I don't, I, well, what do they say he's done? I don't know. And who are they, anyway? The police, I suppose. I suppose that's who they were. They said they were holding him. What for? They said he was a terrorist. Some days later, as I arrived at work, I met our so-called head of chambers, Soapy Sam Ballard, at the entrance. I noticed that all our names, painted up outside the front door had been covered with cardboard. Terrorists, Rumpel. You mean terrorists came and stuck cardboard over all our names? Oh, of course not. I asked our clerk to do it. To what end? If the terrorists found out that a really important barrister was to be found here, they might well bomb the building. Oh, very good of you to be concerned about me, Ballard. I have acquired a certain fame over the years in criminal courts. I've become perhaps a household name, but I doubt whether Al-Qaeda would want to bomb me. I wasn't thinking of you at all, Rumpo. Huh? I have become a leading counsel, whereas you remain, let's face it, an aging junior. I am the chairman of LAC, the Lawyers as Christians Society. Oh. As such, I am the most likely target. Now go along and have that battered old portmanteau of yours searched, will you? Tiffany Kahn, once somewhat improbably Tiffany Timson, sat on the edge of my client's chair in chambers as though prepared to rush off at any moment in search of the husband she had lost. She was easier on the eye than the rest of the Timson clan, and her eyes were dark pools filled with tears. She spoke in a soft and gentle voice about her husband, Mahmoud Khan. Twelve years ago it was when I got the job at Oakwood Hospital. Mm -hmm. That was when I met Mahmoud. He's a doctor. I fell in love with him. His father had come here, built up a chain of corner shops. He also bought a nice house in Kilburn. My faithful solicitor, Bonnie Bernard, ever practical, filled in the details. The house is a palace, Mr. Rumpel. Huh? Really a palace. I wish you could see it. Mahmoud's father died and left it to us. And now Mahmoud's gone and... I'm alone there with the children. Uh, a boy of ten and a girl of eight. When Mahmoud's father's corner shops began to fail, he had to sell them all. But uh, he kept the house. 
A really nice property, Mr. Rumpole. Yeah, I'm sure it is. But your husband, Mrs. Khan, he is now... Arrested. They came for him one morning, just as he was taking the children to school. They took him away. They wouldn't give us any reason. Oh, uh, of course not. Our present Home Secretary... Fred Sugden. Fred Sugden, indeed. <laughs> he has relieved the prosecution of the responsibility of making any charges or reasons for the arrest. You see, neither Dr Carr nor his father became British citizens, so he could be deported. Back to Pakistan. He can't go back there, Mr Rumpole. Huh? He left without them knowing it. It'd be more than his life's worth. Why? All he would ever tell me was politics. Hmm. And you have no idea of why they took him away? Because of what he is. You mean a terrorist? No. Pakistani. That's why they're all against him. Mm -hmm. All my family are against him too. And never mind what sort of trouble they all get into with the police. I've done the worst crime. I've married a foreigner. Uh, this government of ours has done quite enough harm to our age-old and much-prized legal system, but I don't think it has quite got to the stage of making the fact of having been born in Pakistan a criminal offence. I I've got a few friends in the Home Office. I found out Dr Khan's in Belmont. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's where they put terrorist suspects. Although nobody really knows what the exact charges are. Uh, we'll do our best to find out all we can. If you want someone to say that Mahmoud's no more a terrorist than I am, there's our friend Barry. Barry who? Barrington Whiteside. Hmm? He's the hospital administrator at Oakwood. He's a real friend to both of us. His wife is Pakistani, and she's so lovely to us all. I'll make a note, Bonnie Bernard. Yeah. We could do with a character witness. He'll help Mahmoud. I know he'll help him. You'll bring him back to me, Mr. Rumpole. You'll help me find Mahmoud and get him out of trouble. All my family say you're wonderful in court. Yes, but your family usually knows what they're accused of. All the same, I'll do my best. Living with Rumpole. I think it's about time I describe what it's like living with Rumpel. It's no picnic, I can assure you. Of course, he's very full of himself at the moment. He's met some girl who apparently has eyes like dark pools full of tears. Well, that's pretty understandable, as she's married to some terrorist Rumpel is actually planning to defend. At my friend Marcia's house, where I play bridge in the afternoons, I met the most charming judge, Leonard Bullingham. He says he knows Rumpole well, and quite honestly, I think he took rather a shine to me. He's promised to ask me out to lunch. I think I shall accept his invitation. I don't suppose there is such a thing as a nice prison, but Belmarsh was particularly objectionable. I was searched three times on my way in, and my file, in which I keep my notes, was taken from me, presumably because it was seen as a weapon of mass destruction. But eventually we were in the interview room with Dr. Khan. Small, thin, and apparently totally mystified by his incarceration. I am sorry, sir. I've never heard of you. Have you not? Oh. I thought I was pretty well known as a defending barrister at the Old Bailey. However... Uh, this is Mr. Bernard, my instructing solicitor. Uh, how do you do? Hello. Your wife came to see us and asked us to take on your case. This must be terrible for my wife and the children, too. They must be mystified. We've been served with a statement accusing you of association with various terrorist groups, planning to blow up important London buildings, Big Ben included. Sounds ambitious. Is there any truth in it at all? Of course not. How could there be? Do you know anyone who talks to you about terrorism in England? Anyone who says that they approve of it? If, if they did, I would immediately end the conversation. I love England. I have an English wife. My children go to English schools. I've spent the best part of my life here. 
England is my home, my dear, dear country. Well, you don't have to go that far. I mean, it's not compulsory to respect the royal family, eat roast beef and care deeply about cricket. Oh, but I do. I have a huge respect for Her Majesty. Tiffany can cook excellent roast beef, and I often take my boy to watch cricket at Lord's. It was all too good to be entirely true. The amused stoicism, the enthusiasm for England. Wouldn't an innocent man have boiled over with anger, raged against the authorities, damned the police, and had nothing but contempt for the country which had falsely arrested him? Would an innocent man treat the whole affair as though it were an unfortunate but slightly amusing collapse of a number of wickets? Have you any enemies, Dr. Khan? People who might have informed the police against you. Enemies? Tiffany's family don't like me very much, but that hasn't landed me in prison, has it? No, probably not. There's only one way to flush a bit of information out of the powers that be. We're going to appeal against your detention. Then we might get some clues to what this is all about. We're going before Sire. That's the Special Immigrants' Appeals Committee. It's chaired by a judge and heard in the law courts. You can be represented there by the counsel of your choice. I assume that will be Mr. Rumpole, whom you have now met. Mr. Rumpole, of course. Now I remember the name. Yeah. I have read it often in the newspapers. Oh. <laughs> I know that you, Mr. Rumpole, are a great fighter for the truth in the courts of law. Uh, well, we can only hope that Syak will indeed turn out to be a court of law. The Mad Bull had postponed sentence on Percy Timpson. Later that week, when I attended to see him sent down for two years, I was given an urgent message to proceed to the Old Bailey Canteen, where certain members of the Timpson
family were gathered to talk to me. They were a formidable group. I had often defended Fred, Tony, Cyril and Dennis Timpson, but Dennis was clearly the leader and spokesman, as befitted his position as my most regular client. We're here, Mr Rumpole, on a serious matter. Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't do more for Percy. It was a more or less hopeless case. It's not Percy we've come about. Hmm? That's not an important issue. It's you defending the Pakistani doctor. That terrorist you seem to want to help. I see no evidence that he's a terrorist. <laughs> Never mind about the evidence. The family view is, Mr Rumpel, that you shouldn't be helping Dr Mahmoud Khan in any way, shape or form. Is that the view of the meeting? It's too right, Daddy. My boy Will here. He took a shine to Tiffany. And he got to know Dr. Mahmoud pretty well. I made Tiffany a fair proposal. And our Will had a lot to offer. Own home in the Epping area. Porsche car, wasn't it? No, Dad. Lamborghini. You didn't like him, did you, Will? Didn't take to him, no. <laughs> Terrorism. Didn't know what they got him for? Yes, but we haven't heard any evidence. And, you know, I'm just an old taxi, that's what I am. If a client flags me down, I'm bound to take the fare. You defend him, then. But if anyone of the name of Timpson needs a legal brief in the future, I'm afraid we shall have to look elsewhere, Mr Rumpole. Do I express the view of the meeting? I see. Naturally, I was perturbed at the Timpson threat to the Rumpole economy, but Dr Khan was my client and I had to look after him. To that end, I called for a conference with Barrington Whiteside, the hospital administrator. We didn't meet in chambers. I preferred the less formal atmosphere of Pomeroy's wine bar. Tiffany and Bonnie Bernard were in attendance, and the proceedings were assisted by a bottle of Chateau Thames embankment. He asked us to call him Barry, and seemed entirely convinced of Mahmoud's innocence. I agree with Tiffany. They've just picked on him because of his race. I can't stand racial prejudice. My wife is Pakistani. We've all four of us been friends for years, haven't we, Barry? Yes. And Mahmoud's done such great work at Oakwood. Do you know, Mr Rumpel, visitors are rarely treated well at hospitals. They're not told much or made particularly welcome. Mahmoud's changed all that at Oakwood, hasn't he, Barry? He certainly has. There was an old building in the hospital grounds. He's turned it into a magnificent relatives and visitors centre. Mm. We have the best relations with visitors of any hospital in the country. Mm. So, do you believe that he'd be capable of any sort of crime? Of course not. He's got too much to lose. A beautiful wife and children. Splendid house on the right side of Kilburn. It's really Queen's Park. Benazir and I slum it down at the wrong end. Mm. We try not to show them how jealous we are. <laughs> oh, Barry, you know you and Benazir are always welcome in our house. Let's talk about your husband. Did you notice anything, anything at all unusual, in the week or, let's say, the month before he was arrested? He said he thought he was being followed. Huh? He said that once or twice. I'm not quite sure how he got the idea. When was that? Last year. We went away for a holiday just before Christmas. It was after that. Did he say who was following him? No, just that he'd noticed there'd be a man near him and he'd get off the bus just after Mahmoud did. Sometimes he turned round, but the man had managed to disappear. Was it always the same man? I think so, yes. Did he say why he thought anyone would follow him? Yes. He said he thought they were pestering him to buy more raffle tickets for the hospital ball. <laughs> he made a joke of it. He always made a joke of things. That was his way. Now, to get back to business, do you think you'd like me as a character witness? I think we'd love you as a character witness. There might be some difficulty with the hospital board about that, but whatever they say, even if they cut up rough, you can count on me being there, Mr Rumpel. Mm. I'm not letting Mahmoud down. Well, thank you, Mr Whiteside. My memoirs, chapter three. Brenda Hoskins, who sometimes turns up at the bridge club, 
tells me her barrister husband saw Rumpel with an extremely beautiful young woman in that awful wine bar he frequents. When challenged, he admitted it was the pool-eyed little number, wife of the terrorist he's defending. My reaction has been to advise that charming judge, Leonard Bullingham, that I'll be delighted to have lunch with him just as soon as he has a day off court. Rumpel has gone after the Royal Courts of Justice to try and get his terrorist out of prison. He says he's going to attack the whole system of imprisonment without trial. He's never more cheerful than when he's taking on an impossible case. My name's Rumpel. I understand I'm against you in the Khan case. Oh, my dear. I hope you're not going to attack me viciously. Everyone tells me you're a terror down at the Old Bailey. I wonder if that's true. <laughs> the speaker was Peter Plasto, QC. Youngish, good-looking, with a superior smile. I gathered he was the Prime Minister's favorite QC and valued friend. Destined for a high place in the affairs of state. I haven't seen you much round the Old Bailey. Oh, no. I avoid it as much as possible. Now, is there anything I can do to help you before we go into battle? Yes, there certainly is. You can give me full particulars of the charge against my client. Ah, ha, ha. I'm afraid we don't do particulars. All I can tell you is that we have reason to believe your client indulges in terrorist activities. But what activities? Where? When? With whom? I'm very sorry. But the powers that be think it's far too dangerous to let you know that. When those sorts of details are referred to, you and your client will be asked to leave the court. You mean we'll never hear what the charges are? Not in any detail, no. And you call that justice? Perhaps justice isn't as important as security in these troubled times. We call it sensible. Then I'll have to make an application to the judge. Why don't you do just that? I'll be fascinated to hear what she makes of it. Mrs. Justice Templet had sat on the bench for many years. In fact, she was appointed when there were not nearly as many women judges as there are today. On her elevation, she seemed to feel it right to suppress any feminine qualities that might cause controversy. She wore no makeup, although it was said that she allowed herself a thin line of lipstick when trying murder cases. Her first name, which was Floribel, was kept strictly under wraps, never to be referred to. She behaved with particular severity towards any woman unfortunate enough to appear before her in a divorce case. She was flanked by other members of the committee, who seemed to have been placed there merely as bookends, because Floribel Template gave them little opportunity to intervene in the proceedings. Mr. Rumpel, we understand you have some sort of application to make. Indeed I have, my lady. And it's not some sort of application. Mm. It's an application which concerns our civil rights, our liberty, and the basic principles of the criminal law. Very well, you may proceed. Her ladyship sighed heavily and looked at me as though I were some woman taken in adultery or had at least been caught pinching knickers in Marks and Spencer's. You may make your point shortly. I can make it very shortly. <laughs> Dr. Kahn is at least entitled to know what the charges are against him. That he should be denied that right is unthinkable. That's all I have to say. Is it really, Mr. Rumpo? You're not normally at a loss for words. <laughs> at this, the bookends giggled obediently, and Peter Plasto smiled. Very well, if your ladyship wants further argument. To proceed with this case without knowing the charges would be as sensible as a treasure hunt in a dark room from which the treasure had been completely removed. <sighs> I needn't trouble you to reply to Mr. Rumpo's argument, Mr. Plaster. I'm grateful to your ladyship. It's well known that the government cannot disclose this information to the appellant or his legal advisers. To do so would be to disclose the sources of the information. Mr. Rumpo, as is well known, has practiced in criminal courts for many years, and he appears from his present submission to be living in the past. <laughs> It is for us on this committee to deal with present circumstances and present dangers. No further details of charges, as Mr. Rumpel calls them, will be given to Dr. Kahn. I'm grateful to your ladyship. The so-called trial continued. We had to leave the court 
while Plasto told her ladyship and the bookends what the case was all about. I called Barrington Whiteside, who gave Khan a good report, and Mahmoud, who said he wasn't a terrorist, and then I rose to make my final speech. This government, which wouldn't know a constitutional right if it came up and shouted in its ear, has told us that the terrorists want to destroy our way of life, our civilization. Everything we hold most dear. Well, all I can say is that our government is working night and day to help them to destroy our civilization and to give away our most precious liberties. You can take them, says the government today. You can have Magna Carta. We've got no use for it. And while we're about it, we'll throw in the presumption of innocence and the Bill of Rights. All I could ask your ladyship to do is to decide Dr. Khan's case according to the principles of a fair trial which we have fought and struggled for over the centuries. Let Dr. Khan be told the charges he faces and then let him answer them. Mr. Rumpole, have you anything more to say? Only this. Ask yourself what justice really means and then do it. That was a fine speech, Mr. Rumpole. Mr. Rumpole always makes fine speeches, but they don't always win cases. Thank you very much, Mr. Bernard. There's no justice. A very little nowadays, I'm afraid. But one has to think of another way out. Don't give up hope. I shall not trust in hope. You will tell my wife all that has happened? Of course we shall tell her. So Dr. Khan went back to Belmarsh, and I headed off to the Myrtle Restaurant where Peter Plasto had unexpectedly invited me to lunch. I'd been to the Myrtle once with Hilda, and it was as I remembered it. Waiters with white aprons, soft lights, quiet, contented voices of people unknown to me who had become celebrities on television. Peter Plasto tasted the wine. I've chosen a rather unpretentious little saint Emilion rumple. Hope you find it amusing. I'm sure I'll find it hilarious. I took a mouthful. It was a cut above Chateau Thames embankment, but I couldn't for a moment see its joke. I've got good news for you. Well, I could do with some of that at the moment. The International Court says we mustn't imprison people without trial. Khan's being released. Thank you. I'm surprised. I'm sure his family will be delighted. So you see, we're not so bad as you said in court. You aren't? <laughs> I can speak for the government. Now I'm to become the new Minister of Justice. Mm. The announcement's to be made tomorrow. I suppose I should congratulate you. Ooh. Cheers. Cheers. Of course you should. Particularly when you hear what I've got to offer you. Another shot of that extraordinary wine? Of course. Um, but what I need to say, Rumpol, is this. You've become a well-known figure in law, and you have gained something of a reputation among young and impressionable lawyers. Well, I suppose I might have gained a certain notoriety. In fact, some of them would describe you as a national treasure. Mm -hmm. That's possible. I'm afraid my wife Hilda might argue... I would but... say you are a national treasure. Mm. Quite definitely. And, as I say, we'll be releasing your client, Khan. In return for that, I have a favour to ask. What's that? We don't want a lawyer of your age and stature who may be admired by the younger generation rocking the boat. Which boat is that, exactly? The ship of state. The Prime Minister is doing his best in the war against terrorism. Can't have his hands tied by outdated law. You mean like Magna Carta and the Bill of Rights? I heard you at the Sayak Appeal for Dr. Khan. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that was held in private. But if a lawyer of your standing gave vent to such opinions in public... Well, wouldn't be helpful at all. So, what are you suggesting? You've worked hard, Rumpole, but soon the briefs may stop arriving. What about a safe job, hmm? With a pension at the end of it? How does his honour Judge Rumpole sound to you? You mean a circus judge? Circuit Judge Rumpole. Of course, when you're on the bench, it would be most inappropriate for you to make political statements. And I'm sure you wouldn't want to criticise a government that had given you such promotion. You asked me what His Honour Judge Rumpole sounded like. Yes. 
Well, to me, it sounds disgusting. And I shall carry on abusing your government from the rooftops if necessary. Then there's nothing more I can do. For you, or for your client. <coughs> Excuse me. I must go. I have a meeting with the powers that be. Fortunately, he remembered to pay the bill. But I had to forego my summer pudding and make my way back to the conference in Chambers. There were three people in my room when I returned, and I expected smiles of delight and gratitude when I told them that Dr. Khan had been released. On the contrary, Bonnie Bernard looked solemn, Barrington Whiteside angry, and <laughs> Tiffany was in tears. He's under house arrest. It's an outrage. Yeah. He can't leave the house. <laughs> He's a good doctor, and he can't leave the house to go to the hospital he loves. It seems our country is just as bad as everywhere else, Mr Rumpole. People are locked up for no reason. We still have jury trials where the prosecution has to prove its case. We need to get one of them for Dr Carr. It's all we're asking for. Just get him a fair trial, Mr Rumpole. A jury would acquit him for sure. The thing is, Rumpole, how do we persuade the authorities to charge him with some criminal offence? I don't know yet. Oh. I'm very sorry. What could I do? Ought I to retire from the scene and become a circus judge? They had come to me for help, and I'd been afraid to admit that the situation was hopeless. Another irritating thing about Rumpel... It seems he was offered what he calls a circus judgeship, and he was mad enough to refuse. He said he didn't want to get a complaint called judgeitis, which he described as a bad attack of pomposity and self-regard, with a habit of sucking up to juries in order to get Rumpel's clients convicted. I told him I had now met Leonard Bullingham, who was charming, and was not in the least like that. He thanked me for giving him that information. I said, that he's perfectly charming. No, said Rumpel, that his name's Leonard. Leonard has fixed a date for our lunch at his gentleman's club in St James. We lunch in the smaller dining room, he said, the one that allows women. Yeah, I can recommend the roast beef. They do a particularly fine Yorkshire pudding here, and the club clare is quite respectable. Mm, that'll be a change from the stuff Rumpole brings home from that dreadful little wine bar of his. Oh, oh, what a mistake. Only the best is good enough for Hilda, eh? <laughs> well, uh, I have to say, Hilda, I've been looking forward to this little lunch together for some time. I've been looking forward to it, too. Uh, I'm interested in seeing your club. Oh, oh, so glad you said that. My wife, well, she's no longer my wife. We're divorced, of course, but uh, she didn't visit the club at all. Really? <laughs> she was a woman who, who couldn't join in. Well, I don't suppose she was allowed to join in. Anyway, at least not in the large dining room. Oh, <laughs> that's very sharp of you. <laughs> very sharp. <laughs> if the day ever comes when they allow women members in this club which would be over my dead body. You, Hilda, are the first person I put up as a female member. We had gone through the roast beef, and Leonard had instructed me to choose the profiteroles from the sweet trolley. Mm. Rumpole's not an easy man in court. I get the feeling he's not an easy man at home. Would I be right? Quite right. <laughs> After a divorce, of course, one does get lonely in the evenings. I just wonder, Hilda, if you've ever thought of going through what I did. I mean, uh, has the word divorce ever entered your mind? Oh, plenty of times. Plenty of times? Oh, well, that's encouraging. All I can say is that Rumpole's a lucky man to have you to come home to, Hilda. And the next time you think of divorce, I'm sure you'll remember this lunch we had together, eh? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, now, may I refill your glass with the club's exclusive claret? Thank you. 
There was no more talk about divorce after that. And after lunch, Leonard showed me the club's interesting collection of porcelain and numerous portraits of old judges. Then he put me in a cab. He has an account with this taxi firm. I went straight into the box room to add this report of our lunch to my memoirs. I didn't tell Rumpole that I had received what amounted to a proposal of marriage from Judge Bullingham. I didn't mention that fact to Rumpole. I don't think he would quite understand. In any event, we're off on holiday next week, so this is not a time to be rocking the boat. <laughs> One significant event occurred before we went off on our holiday. As part of our continuing legal education, the Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Fred Sugden, would appear for a question-and-answer session in the Temple Hall. I got myself a ticket and sat down to watch a shortish square man being interviewed by Soapy Sam Ballard, the so-called head of our chambers. The occasion was considered intriguing enough to be relayed on television. Can I ask you, Home Secretary, what it feels like to be on the home territory of the judges and lawyers of whom you have been a little critical in your recent speeches? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was brought up in the back streets of Birmingham. I knew nothing of this place where judges and their fathers and their grandfathers ate fancy dinners and tried to take the law into their own hands. <laughs> keeping the law unchanged and unchangeable. But judges don't make the laws. Politicians like me, who had an 8,000 majority at the last election, do. And what do that 8,000 and millions of other voters really want? They want to sleep safely in their beds. And they are a bit interested in legal theories carefully designed to keep the crook and the terrorist out of trouble. Well, thank you for that, Home Secretary. Now, uh, who's got the first question? I have. Oh, oh it's a <clears throat> Well, what's the question? I have a client who is under house arrest. He's never been tried. He's got no idea of the reason, if any, for his imprisonment. He can't carry on his practice as a doctor. Why can't you charge him with terrorist activities or give him a fair and decent trial in front of a jury? But you know perfectly well, Mr. Um... Rumpo. Ah, Mr. Rumpo. Yes, I've been told to expect a contribution from you. <laughs> I, um... I understand you looked on as a sort of a permanent fixture down at the Old Bailey. You've been there as long as anyone can remember. Yeah, well, never mind about me and the Old Bailey. When can my doctor client be given a fair trial according to the law? No, I'm sure, Mr. Rumpole of the Bailey, you're anxious to get a nice, fat brief out of a jury trial. It's not a question of a fat brief. It's not only that you seem never to have heard of Magna Carta or the Bill of Rights. Now you're convicting poor people. The homeless, those sleeping in doorways. You're convicting them without any sort of trial, fining them when they have no money, and all on the say-so of overworked policemen acting on hearsay evidence. All this and imprisonment without trial. Aren't you a lawless government? <laughs> Let me ask you this, Mr Rumpel. How do you take notes in court nowadays? I use a pen and my notebook. Would that be a quill pen? <laughs> no, a fountain pen. <laughs> so, you're not computer literate? I'm literate. I know very little about computers. That's the trouble with your sort of lawyer, Mr Rumpole. You can't move with the times. Things like jury trials and the presumption of innocence may have been all very well in their day, but times change. History moves on. We need quicker and more reliable results. Modernise, Mr Rumpole, that's what you need to do. Modernise? You'd rather take the law back to some date before Magna Carta. <laughs> I, I, I think you've had a fair old innings, Mr Rumpole. I'm sure there are a lot of other people who'd like to take up their questions. I sat down and was silent. Whatever had happened to me, it certainly wasn't cricket. When I got home to Hilda, she said, That Fred Sugden seems a fairly straightforward sort of fellow. What? Well, did you have to be so rude to him, Rumpo? Oh. 
Later, Bonnie Bernard rang me. A memorable performance on the telly, Rumpole, but I thought you'd planned to get round the Home Secretary. Yes. Weren't you going to try to charm him into giving Khan a jury trial? Thank you, Bernard. I went to bed angry with both of them, but angriest with myself for doing my client no good at all. I was also troubled with the feeling that I knew Fred Sugden from some distant event I couldn't now recall. I tried to put the memory of that not particularly triumphant evening behind me. We were, after all, about to go on holiday. I must say I have always rather disliked Brighton. It has a slightly raffish air about it. A little tarnished, jovial, but not quite respectable. Descriptions which have, I regret to say, been applied to Rumpel. We listened to the brass band and walked along the pebbled beach, and in the Xanadu, a small hotel near the station, Hilda made friends with Ian and Mara Antrim. This Ian Antrim was a pleasant enough fellow, good-looking, curly hair, gone grey, but I saw he looked at me from time to time in a nervous sort of way. One evening, after our wives, he called them the girls, had gone to bed, he bought me a brandy in the empty hotel lounge and said quietly but with some anxiety, You, um, you won't tell Myra, will you, Mr. Rumpel? Mm -hmm. About what? Well, the Scarlet Band, of course. Myra knows nothing whatever about it. The Scarlet Band. The memory of some long-distant criminal trial began to return to me. Well, wasn't that a, a group at some university? Reading or Bristol? Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire, mm. that's right. That's right. You protested a lot. Well, we had a lot to protest about. Mm. Vietnam, apartheid. Mm. The treatment of blacks in the southern states. Yes, didn't, didn't you plan to attack an American reading room somewhere off the King's Road? Break the windows, bust up the furniture, something ridiculously ambitious. Mm. Yeah, I've got to admit it. Yes, as you did in court, from what I remember. <sighs> of course I was young. <laughs> now I've got a decent job as an estate agent around the Sussex area, but... Oh, well, that time. Looking back on it... Turned out to be the only part of my life when I felt really alive. Mm -hmm. I remember in my mitigation speech, I said you were a hopeless bunch of foolish youths who would never have hurt a fly. Yes, I know. I know you said that. Yeah. Made us very angry at the time. Well, if I hadn't said, you might have got three years or four, not just 12 months. All those threats of bombs, did you really mean them? I'm afraid our leader did. One of us had even found a book on how to make explosives in your own kitchen. Mm -hmm. One of you? Which one? Was it you? Oh, no. Not me, no, no. no. The one that never came with us to the American Library. And I'm sure he was the one that tipped off the police. Mm -hmm. I suppose he thought it was a better bet to be on their side. We despised him for that, but we didn't give him away. We never referred to him in any of our statements. Well, you, you may remember that, Mr. Rumpel. Yeah, yeah we, we, we never implicated him or anybody else. Yeah. Well, who was he, then? The one who grasped? There was a considerable silence, then. No sound but the ticking of a clock on the mantelpiece. Then Ian Antrim took a long swig of brandy and gave me the name. And the empty lounge echoed with the quite unexpected sound of my laughter. <laughs> In part one of Rumpole and the Reign of Terror by John Mortimer, Horace Rumpole was played by Timothy West. His wife Hilda was Prunella Scales. Judge Bullingham, Christopher Benjamin. Tiffany Kahn, Lily Bevan. Soapy Sam Ballard, Michael Cochran, and Bonnie Bernard, Bruce Alexander. Dr. Mahmoud Khan was Shiv Grevar. Barrington Whiteside, Geoffrey Whitehead. Will Timpson, Ben Crow. Peter Plasto, Christopher Scott. Mrs. Justice Templet, Joanna David. Fred Sugden, Kim Durham. And Ian Antrim, Nigel Anthony. Other parts were played by members of the company. 
Rumpole and the Reign of Terror is directed by Marilyn Imrie and is a Catherine Bailey production for BBC Radio 4.